Very good. Okay, so today, welcome everybody to the Symposium on Engineering Teaching Excellence. Uh, our 2020 topic is online engineering education. And uh, this has been organized by, by our team on the Dean's Council on each, uh, Teaching Excellence. And so uh, they've been working hard to put all these uh, uh, elements of the symposium together. Uh, last year was our inaugural event, and so this, is, this will be the second annual. We hope to keep this going for years to come. Uh, and so uh, on the Dean's Council of Teaching Excellence, we've got professors. Uh, Prasad Kalyan, we've heard from ha Heather Hunt, uh, Craig Cleaver, Jim Noble, and Sarah Orton. Some of those will be uh, presenting in various sessions today as well. Uh, we've got a student member, uh, Drake uh, Civilis, and uh, he has uh, been instrumental in organizing our student panel. Uh, and also there are ex officio members, as I'll call them, uh, uh, Paul Chan and, and me, Roger Fails. All right. And so uh, the program for today, 9 a.m. is uh, to be introductions. And uh, I'll keep an eye on the, the, uh, the waiting room here. Looks like uh, we've admitted one there. Uh, but 9 a.m. introductions. So we've gotten a, a start to that already. Uh, and at 9.15, we're to uh, start our keynote speaker, uh, Johannes Strobel, who's already on the meeting. And uh, at 10 a.m., we ha will have... Uh, um, uh, th whoops, sorry, um, three minute uh, thesis section. And uh, so talks inspired by the, the three minute thesis uh, concept. And uh, after that, we'll have a Q&A session and we'll break up into two uh, um, main groups there, breakout rooms, and we'll have a discussion there. And then we'll all come back and have a main discussion after those uh, uh, three minute theses. And we'll have more details on that when we, when we get to that session. That'll be the most uh, complicated Zoom wise session. So that's why we've had to put uh, Prasad in charge of that. <laughs> Thank you for putting that together. Um, then after that, at 1045, we'll have a student panel discussion. And uh, we were scheduled to have three students on there, and they'll be there to not only do a Q&A session, but kind of give us an idea of what they uh, like and maybe a few things they dislike about teaching with a focus on the online side of things. And then at 1130, we've got our Kemper, Kemper panel, our Kemper fellow panel discussion. And that, that again will be a Q&A session. We've got uh, three of our Kemper fellow awardees um, that are going to um, uh, be at the uh, sort of virtual head of the room uh, for that discussion. And at 1215, we'll close that off and we'll do a closing for the uh, for the symposium and have any final thoughts there. And uh, so it should be a, an exciting uh, schedule today. And I realize that uh, reading day is often a busy day for everyone. So uh, it's likely that people will be joining and uh, uh, coming in and out of the meeting. And so we'll try to stick to the schedule to the extent possible. And uh, speaking of schedule, I think we're right on time to do an introduction for our keynote speaker. So with that, I will have Dr. Heather Hunt, uh, introduce our keynote speaker. All right, so hi everyone. We are super fortunate to have Professor Johanna Strobel as our keynote speaker today. So Dr. Strobel is a professor at the School of Information Science and Learning Technologies in the College of Education at MU, where he conducts research in engineering and STEM education. So his research focuses on engineering and STEM learning through hands-on and online activities. Um, he also studies defiance, empathy, care, and worldviews in engineering. Dr. Strobel has been PI, co-PI, and key personnel of grants totaling $36 million in the US and Canada. And he's co-authored 160 papers and co-edited five books. He's also received the 2018 Science Educator of the Year Award from the Academy of Science in St. Louis and the 2018 STEM Excellence Award from the International Society for Technology in Education. He served as an invited member on the National Academy of Engineering Committee for Implementing Engineering in K-12 and he founded the Journal of Pre-College Engineering Education Research, or JPR as it's known, and he currently serves as one of the associate editors for the Journal of Engineering Education. We are super fortunate to have him here at the University of Missouri. He has been a tremendous resource, collaborator, and support for many of us who do research in this area. So um, please join me in welcoming and thanking him. So Johannes, thank you so much. You wanna take it away? Uh, yes, if you can allow me to share my screen and thank you for the kind introduction it's um 
very fortunate to have great collaborators in the College of Engineering. Um, so let me share my screen. Got it. Can everybody see it? Can everybody see the screen? Yes. Yes, yes sir. Okay, great. So um, this is um, when I got asked to present, I wanted to not overwhelm people with too much theory and stuff, but really wanted to focus on a, a little bit of history of online education, more in the context of what became more important and less important, and then best practices. I want to start with a story. The story is in the field of learning technology is really famous, and it is about this small college that has a an famous polo team. And um, they are winning national championships in polo. And one day the president of the college comes to the polo coach and says, you have been so successful. We just got a massive donation from an alumnus who wants to make a water polo team. So why don't you, as you know, polo very well, why don't you start water polo? Um, it tells you a little bit about what a lot of us may be experienced when it comes to teaching and online teaching. Sounds like the same thing. It's definitely not the same thing if you train horses or you're splashing in the water. And I don't want to diminish water polo. It's a very strenuous sport. Um, and I think a lot of us feel like, wait a second, just because I'm an, a face-to-face -face teacher, this is trickier for me to do online, online teaching. Um, my own experience with online teaching, uh, just to personalize that is, I actually started off teaching online, which is really weird. I started 1999 as a TA in, an, in the first truly online class in Germany. It was all over the country. We had thousands of students who, and it was a massive blowout uh, and blow up. Um, it was like, you know, experimentation of online communication. I mean, emails was barely being used. And so that was fascinating. Um, I do research in engineering education and online learning, but one of the lessons I found when I added face-to-face -face teaching to my, my, when they become part of my job duty, I'm actually a much better face-to-face -face teacher. I realized that online teaching it's really not the same and I lost something when I started teaching online. I also gained something. And so I want to talk a, a little bit about that gain uh, later on. What I mainly realized was I needed to develop an online teaching persona. Meaning when I'm going into a classroom, I have a certain presence. Students encounter me in a certain way. I can start and in interacting informally with students which I'm not able to do in the same way online. So what do I share online? How do I present myself as an approachable human being who is teaching um, has an, is a different, um, I need to find different mechanisms. And I will go to that notion of an online teaching persona later on as well. A little bit about the overview. I want to give a bit of a different models of online learning. What can be actually gained by online learning? Strategies, particularly in the area of teaching and social presence. Then examples of high quality examples of online engineering teaching and resources. And then if um, we have time, I'm, I'm happy of course to do Q and A or if you send any emails later on, I'm, I'm around. So different models of online learning. Um, this is a little bit of a timeline. When, when online learning started, people were very concerned about, in the age of instructional design, they were very concerned about content. What can be taught online? Are there certain content that can be? How is content looking like? We moved then into format. So this is like where research came and said, don't put yellow fonts on green slides and all of more the human computer interaction um, and visual uh, aspects. Then we entered the age of simulation. So we a lot of like, you know, let's have um, simulated environments. Let's have 
things where learners turn on knobs and they get different responses, we can integrate that. Then it became more learning environments. So this is the age where systems approach really took over and that created a lot of learning management systems. We need to put material in there. Um, we need to put a lot of material into where everybody can find material at the same time. It's a repository. And now we are, we are what I would consider is the age of experience. People realize more and more that communities of learners is actually a very important part, that it's not just a teacher and a learner and they're just academically engaged, that this is actually a shared community space. Um, these different images, the, I will come back to them in the next slide. So, um, so if you look at it, we have, you know, an online learning model, which I would consider the talking head, right? You, you're, you might have, you saw Roger's background, right? You have the slide, you have the formulas in the background, you talk and people listen. Um, this is one model of online learning. Um, you could have a very discussion rich environment where of the in, in materials and whatever produced in class are being recorded in this kind of discussion board you ask students to participate actively by, by questioning and by answering questions. Um, you could have a lot of online learning that is teamwork focused. So be like an extension towards problem-based learning, project-based learning, you, you provide uh, material and you provide activities where smaller teams of students work and they are in distributed places. So they're not co-located. And you can have, of course, you know, simulations. This would be here a nursing simulation um, where, you know, you can check out and, and see how the person is doing. You have the, the input of, and, um, of different data and you're making decisions, you are getting prompted. So this was more a simulation in virtual reality. In reality, none of these are excluded good or bad. It is a matter of how to mix it for your own needs and for your own class and for your own style of teaching. Um, we also have self-learning, um, not so much popular in college education. I mean, we don't want just to tell students, here's a course, like run through it. I mean, we do that in the beginning of semesters when we have the newest cybersecurity training and stuff like that. That's considered correspondent self-paced courses, um, not really any instructors there, not any other co-students there. Um, the quality oftentimes is questionable. And then we have MOOCs, which was a big hit a couple of years ago um, and is still being researched and is still being developed, these massive open online courses. Many in the educational community call them more moat, massively outdated traditionally out education. So this notion of, you know, you talk, you give a lot of material, but you don't really allow people to interact a lot and you don't really give much feedback because, you know, if you have a course of 3000 students, what feedback is really possible? More like, you know, an, an acceleration of traditional or in this case, um, a bit of, you know, um, insufficient and in, in, in low quality education. Um, I want to talk a little bit about gains of online learning and, you know, I don't know how it goes with you when you teach, let's say, a class of 100, 200 students and you meet them for two, two hours, how many really can ask questions? And how many questions can you actually adequately address? I find that one of the mass, massive gains of online learning that the quantity of questions and answers can really scale up to a point where people say, yes, my questions have been answered. You can even make that part of the assignments, peer response, so you can have them first come up with, um, I did that in one of my classes, I asked a small team of students to discuss something and what they were not sure about, they posted in a different discussion board 
So the me as instructor, I address then the things that bubbled up from their discussion. So in that way, I triaged a bit that I didn't have to handle 200 students' questions when they were all pretty much the same or the differences. So I addressed what was the most burning things for them. Um, students who would never speak in class, right, in discussion boards. We know a lot of research on, for example, international students, English second language students, um, that they are not necessarily comfortable speaking in class, but they're actually very comfortable speaking in a discussion board because they can take time. They're not feeling the stress of articulating. Um, so actually your quality of questions would also go up. Um, time to articulate questions, time to articulate answers. You might see 500 questions showing up that all go to one aspect of your class and you're like, maybe I should do a video and just upload that because there seems to be something missing here. Something you would actually miss when you're not doing, um, when you're doing face to face and students walk out and you're like, I got two questions, but the rest stared blankly back at me. Did they really learn much? Um, so this gives you a good check in, particularly if you make it part of an assignment. There was a large research study done in, in, in the early 2000s with Brigham Young, Young University. They had a lot of money laying around, so they decided to videotape every single lecture in the university and provided that to students. Their biggest finding was students don't watch you in an one speed. They actually fast forward. They watch you in one and a half or two speed because it's just because actually cognitively we can hear much quicker than I speak. So your comprehension of what I'm saying right now is a lot quicker than what I ever to speak. So a lot of students um, race through lectures and they slow down when it becomes difficult. So what you get there is also a bit of an efficiency model. If you have them actually listen to your lectures online, you might spend 40 minutes, they might spend 30 minutes on it, and they're still getting most of the information that you provided. The last piece is really access to classes, reaching students beyond from beyond Columbia. Um, there's a notion of, you know, I, I, when I was in the College of Engineering at Purdue, I was in a redesign course for a thermodynamics class. And at one point it dawned on us that we are probably one of 50 redesign of thermodynamics classes in the country, it's meeting right now. Um, so there is now an opportunity with online classes to actually pool public funding and public university resources to say, why don't we focus together on really good online classes? And then you can put a localized flavor on it, but it also makes it more accessible for students who might study from home or they cannot afford college living. They might stay at home with their parents. They don't want to drive in. So this, we think they lose something. And yes, a lot of them lose something for not having a local college experience, but many students might actually just gain access. Um, I want to go a little bit into theory and, and bring this concept of teaching presence and social presence a little bit closer. Um, so this is a famous cartoon. It started when the internet uh, was going. It's like on the internet, nobody knows your dog. And so these dogs are typing away. And, and, it's, it, and in a way, this problem of nobody knows your dog is actually still existing. There's a lot of research that shows that people in the back of their mind have still the notion Am I really talking with somebody real? To what degree am I engaging with another human being when their body is not there, when I don't necessarily hear their voice, when I don't see a lot of facial expression and body language? Is there something real? And establishing this reality of, yes, I'm a human being, I'm a human teacher, is super important. What is in teaching presence really important is the three aspects of course design, facilitating and then direct instruction. They both have to go hand in hand. It's not just about how you deliver classes, it's, 
it starts from the get-go of how you design your activities, organ, or organize uh, the class, etc. Oops. So what teaching presence argues is the relationship between instructor and student is at the heart of the learning process. Do they feel they are, re they are in a relationship with you? And I don't mean here any inappropriate relationship. I'm talking here about, do they feel you? Do they, do they sense they can come to you and ask, do they, are, are they being hurt when they're having issues? Um, research has shown that interactions that students um, support student achievement and learning satisfaction are frequent and meaningful instructor-student interactions. That is, of course, a bit harder online, and so that needs attention of what that actually looks like. Social presence on the, op on the other side is that feeling of being there with a real person, as I mentioned before. The interactivity among participants, like interaction intensity, how cohesive is a community? Can I fall back on my community? Can I reach people? And that does not mean just the instructor, but maybe team members. The quality of interaction, the effective association. So is there a way of um, emotional connection with each other? These are extremely important parts. So some strategies what you could do, and they are backed by researchers. I found one of the most interesting pieces I have ever read in research was that they analyzed students writing emails to the instructor and then they analyzed how do students feel that the instructor takes their question serious and it was lengths of email it had very little to do with content i mean yes content plays a role right are you addressing are you nicely writing back are you addressing the issues etc but when a student writes you two paragraph long email and you write back and say Sounds good. Okay, I don't mind. They feel, I'm sorry, when I take time to write, you should take time to answer. So this, and they might get the answer they're looking for, but it's this notion of, have you taken care of me here when I'm spending a lot of time writing something? So I would, that's one thing I would recommend you doing, thinking about the lengths of emails. And I know it sounds, at some degree, it sounds stupid, right? I mean, it sounds like, why do I need to fluff up my emails now with, with more words? But it is a notion of respect to somebody who writes to you and takes their time. What I would recommend also is in large classes, you know, the student faculty interaction, you can't communicate with 100 students all the time in a very detailed manner. What I'm doing is in, in, in classes, I'm literally making a spreadsheet selecting my students into different buckets and then say this week i'm spending with this subset of students i'm making to connect with all of them and the next week i'm changing it and the next week i'm changing it so they're all feeling in some level with connected with me while it's not overly burdensome on my end to constantly communicate with hundreds of students Remember that not, not all teacher-student interaction has to be academic. Management, check in. Um, it's, it's great to make jokes. It's maybe sending a an, an, an little video saying, we are, we are entering the end of the semester. You know, are you, are you, do you have enough coffee? Do you have enough Coke? Um, do, you, do, you, do you have enough food? Um, did you get enough sleep you preparing for classes? Um, I know you have tests, three tests in a day. This is brutal. I'm here, right? I mean, we are, we're getting through that together. Let me know what you need. This goes a long way. This might not be, um, you know, academically important, but it's super important for their, for their learning, nevertheless. What I found when I taught in engineering classes, so I, I taught um, manufacturing, I taught product design and development, I found it really interesting how my students reacted differently when I shared stuff from my own work that was related to class. They, uh, they were so much more active, they had a lot more questions, 
They saw me as somebody also that has challenges that I'm struggling with. That was huge for me. And I'm continuing like bringing, I would urge you, encourage you to bring really stories of your own research and challenges. And don't, don't worry if they go sometimes over the head of what your students can comprehend. Because what you're communicating here is not necessarily content. What you're communicating here, there, what we're doing in class has a real world implication. It still impacts my life, my work, my research. So let's go a little bit into high quality examples of online engineering, teaching and learning. So the one, oops, the one resource I want to mention is the NanoHub, um, which is a massive online resource with simulations, learning and teaching material. This is designed by Purdue University. Um, and they had now, I think for 15 years, continuous funding from NSF to produce that. So just side plug, if you do, exciting engineering education work, this is actually very fundable. And, and it can produce actually something that goes beyond um, anything they imagined in the beginning. So there are millions of people coming, a lot of classes use their resources. Of course, this is very nano technology focused. Um, nevertheless, if you want to look at what, what they are producing in materials, it can be very, quite beneficial. This is an interesting um, online free to use simulation of circuitry that I find quite interesting. You see on the top part, a whole you know, file edit draw. So you actually can have students create their own circuitry boards here and test them, um, which can be quite nice to add as a simulative aspect for, for classes if you're, if, you're, if you're teaching or using circuitry in your classes. Um, there are other um, simulation resources. So for example, in the um, 3D modeling area, and I'm teaching a 3D modeling and maker course in the College of Education, they're becoming more and more collaborative cloud-based. So Onshape or Fusion 360, which allow people to lock models, open them up and have them share and invite people to team spaces. So this might be something worth to consider the the other two examples here I have are virtual labs in chemical engineering um, the physics one has surprisingly a lot of engineering I'm not too surprised because you know physics realizes bringing a real world application into physics is a good thing and oftentimes engineering serves as that um, the last one I want to mention is the Canadian engineering education association CEA um, developed or um, started something called the Engineering Collaboration for Online and Remote Education, which has these on the top, you see these um, screenshots of documents. They have like two pages of like, you know, infographics. What can you do um, to build an inclusive virtual community? What can you do um, about in academic integrity in remote and unproctored exams? What can you do for student workload? What are open educational resources and policies around that? So I find this resource quite helpful in, in just getting quick input. Um, and it is produced by engineers for engineers. So um, um, you can see it's a bit vetted and um, they're trying to be very evidence-based. So this is certainly a resource um, I can recommend as well. Um, this is the prepared side of my talk, and um, I'm more than happy to to answer to answer any questions if you might have them. Of course, I, as I mentioned before, don't hesitate to write me an email. So I can I can certainly answer something too. All right, <clears throat> great. Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> applause for that. That was very uh, very nice discussion of uh, online uh, teaching. Uh, uh, ideas for for engineering and that that sort of thing. Thank you very much for that, Johannes. We do have time for uh, a Q and A. Uh, there have been a few things that have showed up in the in the chat during your presentation, but also uh, I'd like to give a little bit of time uh, to uh, you know uh, ask Johannes some questions. We've got him here, and uh, 
And I, I think you can get some wonderful insights. Johannes, this is yes. Steve Lombardo. Uh, actually, Johannes and I are collaborating on using the three, uh, the maker space for uh, engineering lab class. And I appreciate that. I think it's going well. I have a question. What does, I, I know the students <clears throat> watch at higher than, you know, 1x speed. And I, I kind of joke about that a lot. But is it felt that they're really getting the same out of it when they listen in that speed? I mean, you know, I'm teaching thermodynamics, you know, very difficult stuff. I know you can listen to it more quickly. I wonder if you can learn it more quickly <clears throat> uh, when they do that. Yes, so um, the quick answer is yes, they're getting the same out. And, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is we are cognitively processing sound a lot better and a lot quicker than you speak. The other thing is that um, students have spaces in lectures where they're like, I know where you're going. And so they tune a bit out because they're like, I got that concept and they're just, you know, um, tuning out. And then when concepts are more difficult, then they actually tune back in. And so in that sense, you, you might have in your recorded lecture where people say, I got that concept, I fast forward. And what, we, what that research has shown is they actually slow down when it becomes difficult. They rewind, they, re, they rewind another time. And they're just trying to get and follow along, sometimes really slow, but other parts are like, you know, and I, you might have that in lecture class as well. You see people like fiddling around while you're talking and you might say they're not, they're bored. And maybe that's exactly what they are. They got it, they're bored. You of course has to have to address students who didn't get it yet because you want to keep, you want to bring everybody along. In, in, in me watching a video, that goes very smooth. Um, and, and I can jump over things that make me bored. I actually had an instructor at Purdue Engineering who actually made a test about his, he had a hybrid class. So he asked students to watch a video. If they watch the video, they got a test. If they scored not so well on the test, they were not allowed to come to on-site lecture. Because he said, you, you didn't prepare well enough to earn the right to be in my lecture. And then in lecture, it was like, I, I presume we know all that. Now let's make examples. Let's make projects, like make a lot of discussion. But I assume a certain level of, and I think this is an, an interesting concept. And you might do that, a quick check-in um, exam or just a check in self self rating, how well are you doing and you give them a little bit of feedback and say nope, I don't think you 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 got the important parts yet. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Hi, Johannes. Uh, yeah, this is Dong. Uh, have a, uh, yeah, it's a great talk. Uh, I have a question about this um, uh, student in, um, engagement. Yeah, you know, actually, when we do this uh, actual interview with the graduating seniors, I found um, uh, something really like online format, but some they really hate the online format. And some of their parents even contact us, uh, um, basically saying why we uh, just offer online, things like that. So, so I, what I found actually after talking with those students is that um, um, this online, um, they, they cannot manage, manage their learning very well. That is um, in the on-site course and they have a fixed time, fixed location they go, so they, they can manage themselves well. But uh, online, if they do not have a, enough uh, discipline, I think they cannot really manage well. So how to really uh, help those students who do not like online when we teach online courses? Yeah, yeah it's, a it's, a great, it's a great question. What, what, I'm, what I found when I compare my online teaching to my face-to-face -face teaching, I have a lot more smaller assignments. So I'm trying to build into my class milestones where even when they do project work and we have this big project at the end, I'm making four other milestones. So in that way, I'm getting a, a lot easier and quicker the notion, are they on track? Are they falling behind? And then it also gives them the, I'm progressing. You know, if you have a check mark and you get five points out of 200 
for submitting this and then you submit this and you're working on this and so you're building in um, stepping stones for them that are easily achievable because they are not these big things where then you know if if you have like one big exam in the middle of one big exam at the end and they're having bad time management you know they might start a week before the exam to study and we all know this is not going to work right they they're, they're they're failing but if you have like well you have to make here a little exam and this is just about this chapter or that it's about this part and you immediately get no they didn't do very well so you might give them remedial information you might check in with them so you catch that a lot earlier some um online learning systems also have uh, more un, um, you could you could install institutionally or you can run actually uh, analytics packages with them that kind of give you when did they log in how often did they log in and there are systems like um, signals which was um, which has been developed a, a while ago but it actually gave instructors um, as, um, like similar to street lights, like green, that student does well, yellow, you might want to check in, red one, this student did disappeared. And so it's kind of like, oh, what do I do then with students who, um, who are disappearing or, or, or leveling off? I'm using what is the, the research literature calls volitional messages. Volition is the same as motivation, but on a smaller scale. Like I can say, I want to become an engineer and nothing what you do leads towards becoming an engineer. Your motivation is there, your volition is not there. So if you say, for example, volitional messages to students who didn't log in for three days, didn't log in for a week, did bad on the test. If you send them messages like, hey, what's going on? Or have you seen this resource? Or how is preparation for the next test going? These can be semi-automatized, so it's not a lot of strain on you, but you can prepare these messages and you can reuse them in a variety. So I have a bank of about 50 messages that I'm pulling from and sending to subgroups of students. The, and, and, and you know, I get them back, oh, sorry, my roommate was sick or my cat died or I'm, I'm, I'm now on track or I had a really demanding shift at work and I'm getting back on track. Thanks for checking in. These type of things really help students getting back in on, on, on track. Thanks. Johannes, Brian Maurer had a um, good question in the chat. It was, I'd be interested in hearing about how you feel about assessment of participation and recommended strategies. Yeah. It's certainly a different. Um, it's certainly a different uh, ball game of what is actually considered participation. Um, we we certainly cannot use any more attendance. I I think it's it's not a really good model of you know counting counting uh, butts in seat. Um, I, I I would go and and what I'm offloading a participation is a lot into discussion boards participation and, and I have like, I, I'm happy to share that I have a, a document I put in any canvas discussion board I have that says, how do you get full points in a discussion board? This is what a meaningful discussion looks like. I'm, I'm not, you know, if you have a class of 100 students, it can be super overwhelming for them. They go in two days after a discussion assignment starts and they see 50 messages and they're like, I never be able to catch up. What I tell them always is choose a small subgroup of students and discuss with them meaningfully, meaning you write something, but you also provide feedback and, and answer or ask clarifying questions to other small, to other students, to a small group of students and continue that discussion throughout the semester or throughout this particular exercise. So for me, participation has a lot more to do with student-student interaction than with anything else. Thank you for that. And I just wanted to give a shout out to you. Johannes had given me some discussion board um, ideas and rubrics and um, exactly what he talked about we offered to share. And I would say that they work really well. I have never seen the depth of discussion in a class in person that I have seen on some of my discussion boards. I mean, some of my students get into like knockdown, drag out arguments and they're like putting up 
publication after publication, like, well, this publication said this, and, I, and these are students who I would never hear from in class. So a well done discussion board can be amazing. So thank you, Johannes, for that, because you saved my class on numerous occasions from that. I see also the comment about, you know, students got the illusion that they understand. Um, absolutely. And I don't think that's anywhere different than face to face. They walk out and they're like, yep, 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 I got it. If we don't find meaningful assessment, authentic assessment, where they have to use what we presented to them in, an, in some form of context, like we heard about this particular way of measuring heat transfer. Here's a little scenario. What would you do? And if they fail that scenario, they had an illusion that they understood. Um, and, and I think that's, that's not very different between online and face-to-face. -face. Um, I, I had students at Purdue, they were famous for bringing pillows to lectures uh, because they didn't want to put their heads onto hard desks. And you know, they, they, they at least were versed about their, their illusion of I'm understanding in, you know, I'm absorbing through sleep. Um, but, you know, we have so many different ways of asking students, show me how this concept works. Give me an example in an, give me an example where you think this principle is applicable. They can be very small questions. If they cannot find an example, maybe they don't understand it, what it, what it means. Right, and, and you, this could be a great discussion pointer. I talked about X in class. Now give me an engineering example. Search a little bit engineering projects that go on in the world. Show me how this thing is being moved and being used in an engineering practice. Or you show five clips of engineering projects and say, where is that principle at work? Show me in these videos that you pre-selected where principles are at work and how are they being, being used? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks. People share a lot in the in the chat as well that what they're using because this is what it's about, right? It's sharing what works, what doesn't work. There's an you know, I I, I think we gotta be honest and, and I, I hope to do that in the beginning. I'm I'm a much worse online teacher than I'm a face-to-face -face teacher. It, this is not like here is what I, what I'm the expert in. That this is like I struggled to develop something that might work over many years of testing and failing. I I'm willing to at all. All right. Uh, looks like there are a few other uh, items in the in the chat. There um, looks like. Uh, Pat Panero um, talks about participation and breaking uh, the course into small teams or groups uh, to work on activities uh, and attempt to flip the classroom online. Uh, did, did you talk about the, he asks, uh, what are the alternatives to uh, flip in a time efficient way? Maybe. Uh, yeah. I think about. with the whole flipped classroom concepts, it's always like the question, what can you do best in the comfort of your own couch uh, when you sit in your sweatpants? And what can you do in the comfort of an, because you're working on something? So that for me is always a main criteria. We don't need to listen to somebody in a lecture hall. That concept seems really strange to me because we, we, I watch YouTube videos. I don't have to walk to, an, to a hall, sit in an uncomfortable chair, watching that same material. Yes, if I have questions, it might be great because they get immediately addressed. But if I have a discussion board, I can just ask them and, and get something. So that's a really interesting for me, what is flipping. Now, project work, teamwork is, is usually better uh, to really facilitate in, in um, to really have facilitated not in an, in a setting that, um, you know, it's hard to replicate that 
um, just by, by listening to other people, by your listening to your team members, by watching videos of your team members. This might be really better in a synchronous way, better for them coming together, um, work together, sharing dance. Um, if, if synchronous doesn't work, you know, there's Google Docs and GroupMe and whatever, you know, fascinated. The, my, my, the students I assign teamwork with, they always introduce me to the latest team software that they use. Some, some social media software I never heard about and they're all using extensively in their group interactions. And so that's definitely, yeah. Yeah, Johannes, this is Patrick Monero. I'm just kind of following up on that, on that point. Uh, so the, the issue is that even splitting them into small groups and then interacting with each of those groups synchronously, right? And that's, that's really where you start to it, get them to open up a little more in the smaller group setting. But I mean, what I'm finding is even with 60 students, I'm not, I, my class is not, you know, super large like the mechanical engineering courses, but trying to trying to time management that is is near impossible, right? So we're talking about you know 10, 10 or 15 small groups, and that's occupying you know more hours than I have. I'm going to be very honest with you. Yes. You know, whereas in person, it's much more, it's much easier to manage at what I found, you know. But trying to do this with Zoom and everything else is just, it's, I would, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm running a schedule yeah. that's running from somewhere, you know, 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. now, which yes. is crazy. Yes, it is. What I would recommend is they don't have to, questioning, would they all have to have, would that all have to happen in the same tomb Zoom times? So I would put the onus back on students, meaning, make groups, think what you can do with them, with all of the students. Maybe you're explaining the assignment. Maybe you show them how you would do a part of the assignment you give them as a group, group teamwork. And then let them go and they have to make a report. Now you have 70 students, groups of four. I wouldn't go probably more than that. So what, you're getting about 15 reports back 16 reports back and and mm -hmm. these reports you would say then okay are you hitting what i'm asking you to do so you have to explain to me who did what you have to explain how you split the work if you did and you have to tell me a little bit about your reasoning project i add then a reflective element and say so in this topic that you had to deal with rank yourself from one to ten how well you did list your main difficulties, list, list your main challenge, list your main success. That's an individual part. Yeah. So if you get that back and you see 40 students rank themselves super low and they're having struggling with, with X amount, then that's for me the next thing I do in a lecture or in a video and say, look, I heard that when I looked through your papers and your reporting, here's an input that might help you get over that hump of what you apparently didn't didn't get the first time and that's perfectly fine. Well, obviously the education students are much more humble than chemical engineering students because I haven't <laughs> had any rate themselves that low. Uh, <laughs> generally rate the instructor low, the students high. Uh, but I, I, th I think what you're, what you're the, the response that I'm hearing is maybe it's really on my, it's the onus is on me to create a better, a, uh, a better rubric up front uh, so that it's more proactive on my part rather than reactive to how things right. are. Okay. Also, don't, don't, what, if I understood you correctly, I would say right now, and this, I don't mean the negatively, you create yourself as a bottleneck, right? If it flows all back and you need to be impressed in all groups and you need to be, so if you offload that a bit to your team has to organize I'm giving you tools to organize. How do you deal with conflict in teams? What is expected of you? You produce and you bring in more facilitator, then that eases yours. And they're getting really introduced to an to a really authentic experience of how do you work actually in a team, even if conflict arises. And 
my answer when conflict arises in teams is always like, well, what do you think happens in industry? Mm -hmm. You yes. never have a conflict. I mean, come on, work through it. And yes, you've got to give them then also this notion of your grades are not necessarily suffering just because you have conflict, right? That's right. for me Absolutely. important too. Absolutely. It's a learning experience. You're not in industry here where you might lose your job. I want you to succeed. But if you have conflict, I want rather you to try to solve it, propose a solution. I'm checking in with you if that worked or not. And, and, and you gotta ease them a bit and say, you know, this is part of failing and failing is welcome in this class because, you know, otherwise, how, how would you actually learn if you don't? Yeah, if you yeah don't absolutely. We're, we're on the same page there. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you very, very much. Good. Hey, um, looks like uh, we're running out of time and we need to move on to the three minute thesis. I, uh, this was a wonderful discussion. Uh, thanks very much for this presentation, Johannes. And uh, let, let's thank our speaker again with uh, some virtual clapping, perhaps. I'll do some real clapping. <laughs> thank you very much, Johannes. And uh, we really appreciate your presentation. Very good. All right. Okay, with that, uh, the next step in our program, I won't show a slide because uh, I believe Prasad has a slide to kind of orient us toward the three minute thesis and there it is. Take it away, Prasad. All right, uh, thank you, Hannes. Um, this session is actually all about speed. So we might prove something here. <laughs> this is uh, 10 faculty doing three minutes of ideas, um, a combination of traditional and online ideas. Um, so what we'll do is, you know, I'll have 10 talks. I originally thought there'd be like maybe eight or so. I had a good response. This is fantastic. So we have 10, so we'll exactly have 30 minutes to get the talks through. Uh, I have created two breakout rooms. So we'll have about 10 minutes to kind of digest what happened in those 30 minutes. Uh, and then Heather will help me uh, moderate the online breakout room. I will uh, moderate the traditional breakout room. And uh, the breakout rooms are set up so that you can go in and out as you want. So uh, it's good to you know uh, be part of uh, any breakout room you want to the extent you want to be in. And then um, we'll come back and then Heather and me will sort of summarize what happened in those uh, uh, rooms. So. So that's the plan. So without further ado, uh, I'll start uh, projecting the slides uh, that uh, have been sent by the speakers. Just to keep you on track, I have a timer here. Uh, as it hits two minutes, 45 seconds, I will turn your slide off, uh, which is the indication you need to wind down your talk. I think that's probably the most uh, polite way to you know, cut you off. Uh, so please bear with me when I do that, All right? So let's go. So the first talk is by Professor Dong Xu. Uh, let me bring up his slide. All right, Dong, please go ahead. Okay, yeah. So I just uh, wanna talk about uh, my experience of uh, online questions. Um, so this actually, so my, this semester is my first time teaching online. So I'm still learning, uh, particularly I learned a lot from uh, uh, IT faculty, uh, many of them actually true experts in this domain. And so uh, I found actually a key um, factor of uh, effective learning is really the student engagement. Um, so for face-to-face -face, uh, classes, the students uh, um, have to be there, you can take attendance. Um, but for online, I found that sometimes uh, uh, even uh, I recorded the video, asked them to watch, uh, they, they didn't watch because I had a discussion. I found that I talked a lot at uh, those videos, but they, uh, they didn't even know. Um, so, um, so I realized I really need to find a more a checkpoint to make sure that uh, they uh, follow this um, and then so that I can do uh, some um, quick assessment and also I can just uh, teaching accordingly, and sometimes I have to follow up with individuals. So the design principle, uh, I see that um, uh, the topic uh, should be um, cutting edge, uh, very interesting to them, and uh, there should be some uh, follow-up uh, feedbacks, and uh, the um, questions, they do not have to get a fixed answer. It could be open-ended. For example, here's the real uh, question uh, I used in my teaching, the IT capstone. So this is a ethics scenario, uh, so about uh, using the uh, face recognition software by police and other agencies. 
And so you probably know that uh, San Francisco recently uh, buying, banned such a practice uh, for possible uh, abuse. Uh, so I asked students uh, whether it should be banned or uh, should have a limited use or should be allowed. Um, so it's not just a multiple choice, but rather they have to write a paragraph. Uh, and then we have a follow-up discussion in class. Some of them use this topic for um, these uh, ethics papers. So this kind of engagement that really allow uh, students to think this uh, deeply. And so this kind of a question, it's not like assignment, it's really following a video and then they just uh, need to answer something. And then we give them uh, some credit so uh, to allow them on track. Uh, and I, I found that uh, we could also use technology to help this process, not just the teaching technology, but technology itself could be a powerful tool to help teaching. Um, so uh, Fang Wang and I, uh, we actually uh, uh, explored a little bit uh, to have a so-called personalized teaching approach, uh, basically using AI to guide uh, students. Um, they don't have to watch the same material. They can um, get a real-time feedback. And also we could uh, uh, apply some kind of a gaming system. For example, they could have a team to compete with each other. So I think there's a lot of room to um, it's more in this direction, particularly in interdisciplinary teaching. That's all. Thank you, Dong. That was perfect. Thank you so much. Next up, uh, we have uh, Kiruba. Please take it away. The start of the 21st century saw various climate crises from uh, droughts, fire, floods, and now a pandemic. So the COVID-19 has exposed the social disparities in the world. That is a big challenge. Around 821 million people are affected by chronic hunger and around 2 billion people are affected by hidden hunger. And all these statistics were before the onset of COVID-19. It's been projected around 10 to 14% increase in the hunger rates in US and around the world. So, and these numbers are not just averages and standard deviation. It's breathing, living people, their family and their children who are affected. So that's one big problem. On the other hand, we waste around 1.3 billion tons of edible food annually. Waste, when we think of waste, waste is a terminology created by humans. In nature, there is nothing called waste. Everything transformed into some of the beautiful form and it had its purpose. What if we learn the process of transformation from nature? What, and then we wouldn't be calling it as waste, but rather raw materials for your processing to develop foods to feed the hungry. And so, so that's what in this particular course, the food process engineering, I redesigned this course to incorporate circularity. Like we start with fluid flow to heat and mass transfer in foods, all the way to food packaging, connecting various unit operations to incorporate sustainability into the food system. We use the principles of engineering and connect with the sciences of food to develop sustainable solutions to address challenges in the food system. And thus, I say engineers play a key role in addressing food and nutrition security, and we need them more. Thank you. That's great, Kiruba. Thank you so much. So next up is Sarah. Hi. I'll bring um, up your slide one second. Go ahead. Okay. So I've been working on an NSF funded project looking at how changes in teaching practices can actually improve student self-efficacy. And what's interesting is self-efficacy is a psychological construct. It's the belief in one's ability to be successful at a particular task. It's not an overall feeling of confidence, but it's related to a specific task. For example, you can have self-efficacy in drawing sheer moment diagrams or instructional analysis. It's, you know, hey, I really got this. I know how to do it. Uh, Self-efficacy has been shown be, to be related to outcomes like persistence, performance, and approach versus avoidance behavior. And these outcomes are really important in the success of underrepresented students 
all students, but particularly underrepresented in fields such as engineering. What's key about the self-efficacy is it's malleable. It could be changed by our experiences. And in, as instructors, we can actually increase the self-efficacy in our students by changing our teaching practices and thereby give them more positive outcomes. And you can look at the four sources, the four keys of self-efficacy. Uh, performance outcomes or mastery experiences is doing well or not doing well on a particular task. If you did, some, did something well, you're more likely to try it again. Uh, teaching practices such as active learning, metacognition, structuring skill sets are going to uh, target that area of self-efficacy uh, source. Vicarious experiences, seeing someone else that you uh, can relate to doing well, uh, that would be things like uh, guest lecturers or group work, students seeing other students do well at a task. Social persuasion, being told that you can do well, uh, that would be things like constructive feedback, you know, giving them uh, students encouragement. And then psychological feedback or emotional arousal, those are the emotions generated around forming a task. Uh, that would be something like uh, teaching practices to accommodate test anxiety or developing rapport. As part of the project, we developed uh, a faculty learning community. We've been learning all about these practices and we've actually created a really uh, detailed Canvas page that has a whole bunch of different practices and things you can try in your class. It's too much to put in this three minutes. But if you want access to that Canvas site and to look at some things you can uh, try in your class, just send me an email and you can have access and think about things you can try. It's not comprehensive, it's not perfect, uh, but you know it, it has a lot of information that I think would be beneficial to everyone. That's it, thank you so much. Next up, uh, we have Fang Wang. Go ahead, Fang. All right. Um, so it's clear that if there were any um, lingering doubts about the, 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 the necessity of uh, digital transformation of uh, education, I believe coronavirus had uh, silenced them. Uh, in a big deal. Uh, so I believe the uh, COVID, uh, the pandemic actually is accelerating the rise of uh, uh, the digital, digital transformation of our everyday life, including education. In addition, our new generation uh, are actually growing up with the technology. They are born, you know, they are used to accustomed to using the technology. Uh, so I believe that uh, you know innovative, immersive technology are here to uh, have a will make a great impact in uh, learning. Uh, on the other hand, you know, um, hands-on, in-person, physical touching um, uh, of uh, you know uh, lab equipment of uh, you know experiment are also essential, indispensable experience. As so what I have been trying uh, this semester was uh, um, actually uh, has been a, a, a project for uh, developed for a while, but we actually de deployed this semester a virtual reality powered hands-on lab for um, you know microfabrication clean room uh, experience. So what we have found out was that um, student had uh, you know we actually uh, let student try those virtual reality trainings in the lab then actually eventually bring them to the uh, physical lab to um, actually let them experiment them uh, in a physical uh, space as well. So our findings are, um, you know, students have found that uh, new technology like uh, virtual reality are interesting, uh, gamification in, embedded into those uh, technologies are actually uh, help the learning. Um, when we bring them to the uh, physical lab, they have find out it's things are very familiar, very similar to what they have seen in the virtual reality uh, experience. Um, but uh, also in addition, we are able to create a lot of uh, uh, data, user experience data, analytic data, you know, how they learned, uh, just like Dr. Xu had earlier mentioned that we could have used those data to actually um, you know, personalize the learning uh, for, uh, for the future so that we can uh, make this experience more personalized for individual students. On the other hand, we also find out that uh, it is in fact uh, with the new technology, uh, there are added uh, uh, cognition load for, for um, many. For example, they have to learn how to um, maneuver or you know, um, even um, uh, move in, the, in this virtual space. Uh, other things, for example, um, what we find is uh, 
uh, the virtual uh, reality technology itself didn't really make the learning uh, any easier, right? So whatever the effort they would have to spend in a uh, traditional lab, they actually still have to do that in the, in the virtual uh, lab. Uh, but uh, this is much more accessible, maybe not for today, but uh, down the road when the technology is much uh, uh, mature. Uh, so uh, in my opinion that those technologies are gonna be here to stay to enhance the hybrid uh, learning. That's all. Thank you so much, Frank. Excellent. Thanks so much. So next up, we have uh, Craig. Craig, please take it away. All right. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about strategies I've employed this semester. I still haven't taught an online class. I'm teaching a hybrid class this semester. I have a, a had an in-class component and stuff I put on Canvas. So I'm, I'm just going to kind of discuss and talk about at least my approach to what I hope is effective teaching. So what I've tried to, to do as the first bullet says, I've, I've taken the theory lectures from my classes and recorded them and put them on as Panopto videos. Those go on Canvas. I find that that's worked well because when I show this stuff in the live class, it's kind of boring. You're reading a PowerPoint, you're looking at equations. So put that on Canvas. Students can watch this, you tell them ahead of time, watch these videos, come prepared to class. And, and then when I have an in-person class, I focus that time on working examples. And I encourage everybody to do this. We teach engineering. Let's use these applications from our disciplines to excite the students. And I show my pictures there. I used to work on the space shuttle program. So I talk about space shuttle applications to my class in dynamic systems and control. I teach propulsion this semester. I have them analyze not some made up textbook engine. I have them analyze real engines. They get the specs from the real Pratt & Whitney website and they, they look at how that engine actually works. And airplanes, I'm teaching air aircraft flight performance. They actually look at real airplanes. So I think that's a huge advantage that we have in engineering. Bring your applications to your class. A couple of the, these are nuts and bolts things like evaluating the students in your class. I have learned over the years, let's not count these drill problems, end of chapter problems heavily because students cheat. They find all the answers online. So I just make these drill problems. They got to turn it in. You get a, you either get a check or you don't get a check. I, f I find that if you focus more on projects, Again, projects that are open-ended that involve the real thing, a real jet engine, make that 40 or 50% of your, your class. And then exams, of course, we have to have exams. So the keys that I find to successful teaching, and this is especially true in this semester with hybrid uh, teaching and some of it being online, organization, communication, keep students in the loop, frequent updates on deadlines, be flexible, they have other exams, they have other due dates. And I, I'm fine with shifting an exam date if they've got three exams on that day or possibly shifting a due date uh, on a homework assignment. And then finally, as others have said, keep the class engaged. Um, I found that again, the in-class lectures, work examples, show them real problems. I find that works in my classes, thanks. Thank you, Craig. That's excellent. Thank you so much. And next up, we have Heather Hunt. Um, can you get this screen up? Heather, please go ahead. All right. So grading, the thing that we all love to hate. But if we have to do it, we want it to be done well. That is, we want to provide detailed, critical, and supportive feedback to our students so that the act of doing the homework and getting it back can be a learning experience. And we want to be fair and consistent. And so we have rubrics and we have answer keys and we grade anonymously. And instead of grading one full exam at a time, we grade problem by problem, flipping through each page for our written tests or if they're 
digital, we click to the next student submission on SpeedGrader, and then we scroll down to find the problem that we're on. And somehow it's upside down for this particular student set. And I don't know why on this other students, it's actually after problem five, even though I'm grading problem two. And how did they end up getting this in this order? And then you realize, oh no, I'm pretty sure I gave a completely different comment on a previous student's problem where they made the same mistake. And now I need to go back and find exactly what I said so I can be consistent. Because maybe I feel like I'm being a little bit too harsh on this problem now that I'm I'm seeing this consistent response from students, maybe they just misunderstood the problem statement in general. And by this point in grading, you are exhausted and you need more caffeine and you are on problem two of 10 and on student 17 of 57. And you're thinking to yourself, why is this so incredibly hard? So as my newly minted seven-year-old daughter frequently tells me, have I got a tip for you? So check out Gradescope. It's a new integration with Canvas this spring brought to you by the Office of eLearning. And I promise I'm not actually a salesman on this, um, but it should make your life a little bit easier when you're grading engineering sets or coding problems or really assessments of any type. So think about like equation-based problems, long problems, if you're using a lot of graphs, coding, essays, I mean essays, short answers, whatever it is that you normally do, Gradescope actually makes it quite a bit easier to do the grading. So this has been piloted by faculty at UMKC and s &T, and they are saying, and, and including the engineering, the STEM faculty primarily, and they're saying that it's cutting their grading time in half and allowing them to provide more constructive feedback and more personalized feedback to the students. Um, so when you use Gradescope, you don't need to alter your assignments. The students can submit all of their work digitally, just like I would assume most of your students would be doing now because of the pandemic. Um, so they would submit scans of handwritten work. You can then grade all your sets digitally, much like you would do in SpeedGrader, but it's actually much easier to do it. You can grade problem by problem seamlessly, so you don't have to search, you don't have to go in and out of full sets. And then if you do have a rubric, you can actually make a change to a rubric midway, um, including to the comments that you would give back. So like Johannes was saying that he has this bank of comments and emails that he sends out to students. It's the same thing. It creates this library of it for you. But when you apply those, it will actually back apply it to all the sets you've already graded that had that same mark on it, which makes it just so much more effective. You can also see question and rubric level statistics to better understand where people are going wrong. So you can provide some just-in-time content in your classes. So overall, Gradescope helps you analyze how well the questions worked in assessing learning objectives. Grading shouldn't be difficult. It should be rewarding and meaningful. So if you're looking for something better this spring, do check out Gradescope. Excellent. Thank you, Heather. So next up, we have uh, Ronnie Bazan. Ronnie, take it away. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Ronnie Bazan Antequera, and I actually have two last names. <laughs> I am assistant teaching professor at the Information and Technology Program, and I am leading the cybersecurity track in the program, uh, where we are teaching uh, online cybersecurity courses for the last two and a half years. And more than a year ago, we started uh, the online undergraduate cybersecurity certificate that has three awesome characteristics. Uh, first of all, all the courses are 100% online. And to guarantee the, the quality of the courses, we are having them reviewed by the online quality revision office. And our first, first batch passed the revision with 100 out of 100 points and we are planning to have all of them reviewed by end of 2021. The second characteristics, uh, characteristic of the IT cybersecurity certificate is that it is a standalone, which means that no prior IT experience is required and that even professionals can update their knowledge by taking specific courses as they need. Um, the third characteristic um, of the certificate is the expertise that our staff has since all of them have prior industry experience that guarantee the quality of our courses. In my case, I was working as a senior system administration administrator for several years, and I got a few IT certificates before joining Mizzou. And finally, the last characteristic is that our online courses are highly interactive, um, which means that are not common self-paced courses. Um, as an example, each of my courses has uh, 12 quizzes to measure understanding of concepts. Uh, they have 12 hands-on laboratories to train students with industry-required skills by the use of the latest technology. 
Uh, the courses also have two exams and the most important is the final open project where the students use it as an opportunity to wrap up the knowledge they, that they acquired during the semester into the deli deliverables. Um, the laboratories are released weekly in a module and the students have different options to get help. Besides the av availability of the slides, the students can also access to the recorded videos that are designed for them to easily access to the to specific parts they need. Um, they can also uh, assist virtually to the TA or instructor office hours or schedule different times to get help. Each of the laboratories requires the students to use their own private test bed deployed in their own systems or by using cloud resources. Because of all of these four characteristics, the online undergraduate cybersecurity certificate um, courses are getting great reviews from the students and also we are uh, some companies are approaching us to learn more about our courses to train their data staff. Thank you. Ronnie, great work. Congratulations on the success. Uh, very nice. Uh, now we have uh, June Tech Park. Please go ahead. Hello, everyone. So, yeah, I'm June Tech Park from Empire and Chemical Department. So, yeah. Okay, so I want to present how I'm utilizing this peer review process for my class, the engineering, the process safety and engineering ethics class. So, so I use this peer review process for this to the, the term requirement. Okay, for my class, it is recommended for students to look at many incident reports. So typical class. So if this is just an in-person typical class, then these many topics are assigned to each group and they're supposed to work on their writing paper and they present that their topics. But one is special like this online, the online and then the, this in-person collaboration is difficult. Then what is happening is it's hard to communicate each other. Uh, they are supposed to get together. They don't respond and even the presentation. So they're not paying attention to the other group's presentation. So that's just such as, yeah, they're just busy with their last minute preparation. Once their presentation is done, yeah, they don't pay attention. So, so what I use is the peer review process. It's like uh, the, our the, the paper review. So I assign this peer review for each student. So students prepare their own topic. And then, so I made it confidentially. Actually, yeah, this method I adapted from the merry-go-round the method, maybe you have seen in this online teaching foundation, the online class. So the difference is made it as a confidential. So we don't know the, the whose report it is. So, and then I distribute two or three to other students and then they review they in that way. Now they can focus on at least those topics, their own topics, as well as there are two or three the topics they review. And then it's better than they skipping the score 10, then 10 topics they surely focus on. And also at the same time, so using that review, the students can upgrade their review. So when I actually look at their reviews, yeah, this, uh, I was worried that maybe they just get very crappy reviews, but actually yeah, they're very good. So they're very serious about that. So then because of that, now the, the report is upgraded. So, so also this is also at the same time, this is ethics class. This is a part of the, this ethics aspect, such as giving positive influence on others. So by reading and the reviewing, reviewing their each report, so they giving the positive influence each other. So, okay, so <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Mm, okay. mm. Great, it's a great idea. Thank you so much. Next up, uh, we have uh, Jung Kim. Um, let me bring up his slide. Go ahead, Jung. Okay. Yep. Thanks. So good morning, everyone. Um, augmented reality is one of the advanced technology, and it could be useful as a powerful tool for engineering education. So uh, in my class, I must be 3810 ergonomic class, and one of the teaching metrics is manual metering handling. So we developed AR module for this manual metering handling. And I want to compare that, how students really feel that 
this new technology. So we conducted a between subject study with 32 students and one group only experienced a traditional way to learn this material, but another group, they experienced AR module. So the contents was exactly the same, but I just want to see that how the students are going to feel that and experience this new technology. So we measured the student workload by using NASA TLX, and it includes the six dimensions of mental demand, physical demand, temporal demand, frustration, effort, and performance. And as you can see the, from the result, our students showed a higher workload for mental effort and frustration when they learn manual material handling material in the augmented reality environment compared to the in-class setting. However, they got significantly less stress on performance, which means that when students experience in an AR environment, they had less pressure on the performance compared to the in-person class. But in another way, then when they use AR, they were so frustrated for the like how they navigate the 3D images, and they should have put more effort on that, how they use this kind of images. So first five minutes, the students show me there are some interest about this visual effect, but if that goes beyond five minutes, then they feel tired and they feel some of the inconsistency between the images so that they feel like uh, this is much effort they should have put on. So in terms of the outcome wise, the performance of the student learning, actually AR provide a better outcome because they can do the enhanced uh, hands-on exercise much more enhanced so that they can have a more field experience while they're doing these modules. But actually, you know, the stress level wise, you know, due to the frustration and effort and the mental, they feel they don't like it. But as I said, that the performance wise, they have significantly less stress on the performance perspective. So these kind of thing that we test in our class. So we try to find the best way we can do implement this new technology into the class material so that if we understand better how students gonna experience and feel this new technology, we can make a better module in the future. So that's what we did in my class. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Jen. So we have the last one, which will be from me. Let me bring up my slide. So this will be challenging how to keep my own time. All right, let me start my timer. All right, so um, this is a, a project that is funded by a national security agency that uh, you know uh, is actually being used in my cyber defense course. Uh, this fall, I offered it for the first time, and the idea here is uh, we all know you know cyber attacks are vicious. They're getting more and more sophisticated, and everybody's being attacked. Even if you're a small business, you might think you know what do I have that somebody wants to attack. But uh, the reality is everybody is being attacked. You know, universities are attacked by ransomware attacks. Um, you know, big companies are attacked by exposing private information. So uh, creating the cyber warriors who will go and help us all out uh, in the industry and in research um, is an important uh, you know, uh, task in this course. And so what we have done is we've created this Mizu cyber range uh, with the NSA funding. Uh, it actually is a bunch of um, learning exercises that mimics actual real infrastructure. So you can see here in the diagram, we're building a healthcare application uh, you know, infrastructure. We're building a gaming application infrastructure. So we're building essentially realistic infrastructures and allowing students to learn uh, in a sort of a field and form approach. So uh, the, uh, Heather put this idea in my head. Uh, the idea is you basically in the course, uh, teach them concepts and then uh, you have the students actually go into the field and apply those concepts. Uh, and then they come back and then back to the uh, you know, forum and then do a project where they're solving a real world problem. So they have these lab exercises that train them and then the project is the real world problem. Uh, and we've created this in a way that uh, students can actually do this very quickly. So the TA doesn't have to uh, set up a lot of infrastructure or do a lot of uh, backend work. So it's all automated. It's flexible. We can add. So this semester, we added a financial technology infrastructure. We added a, a new kind of a healthcare infrastructure. Uh, and we can actually practice uh, real cyber world attacks in this infrastructure, uh, do both the red team and blue team or attack and defense kind of things. Uh, and students appreciate, you know, the solutions of cyber defense that, you know, are you know, based on data science or, you know, more of these machine learning kind of concepts. And 
they get to apply uh, to a, a new problem set they've not seen it. And this platform is also very easy to use. They have interfaces, like you see this web uh, uh, dashboard here. Um, and uh, they, you know, we can uh, have as many students take this course. And the cool part is this ranking dashboard. So students are asked questions at the end of the lab. Uh, and based on what they answer, they are given a peer standing. So how good their answer is the auto grading system. And so they can get another chance if they want to improve their grade. So in this way, we have uh, created a, a really good, nice platform, but which allows us to you know, teach students you know, in the learned concept, apply them in uh, realistic test bits, and then uh, create new solutions for uh, becoming cyber warriors. Thank you. So with that, I kept to my time. Um, so the next thing we'll do is we're a little bit over time, but uh, let's take about five minutes or so uh, and uh, go to the breakout rooms. Uh, let me show you what the plan was again. So you get a quick overview. So people uh, who are the speakers, I have some assignments uh, and for the other participants, uh, you can go to any of these uh, breakout rooms and we'll meet back in about uh, you know five or so minutes, uh, five to six minutes, because we want to keep up the time, right? So, and then we'll have a small report back. So let me open the breakout rooms and I'll see you all there. So Roger, it turns out I cannot go into a breakout room because I'm moderating it. <laughs> okay. Would you like to take on uh, the traditional uh, breakout room moderation and come back? So would you like to join that group? And yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll join yeah. it. And uh, do I need to take over the host uh, so you can do that or, or something? Uh, or, or... No, I think I don't want to spoil anything. So why don't you go ahead and please yeah. be the one to report back? Sure, will do. I'll go in, go in there now. Thank you so much. Uh, actually, <laughs> You might need to tell me how to get in there. I, so do I go to breakout rooms and there should be a, a join at the top. Okay, I'm looking for the join. Let's see, I click breakout rooms and is there a join? Well, maybe easier. So oh, here we go. I, I just saw the little button show up. It's kind of okay. I'm joining. Thanks. Hey, Passad, I'm having a problem. I can't find the join button. Sorry. So, so it's, it's if you click breakout room, there'll be a number. You just uh, um, hover on that number. You should see a join button come up. Now, under participants or under breakout rooms? In breakout rooms. When you click the breakout rooms, you oh, should see. Oh, I see. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. No problem. Hey, I'm really lost. Um, I should show my video. Where's the button for the breakout room? I've never used this before. Uh, so in the bottom, you should see a, a thing called breakout rooms. Do you see that? No. I, no, I, I don't see it either. Uh, so there is a version uh, that you need to have. So if you're not upgraded your Zoom in the recent times, uh, that's usually a problem where <laughs> this uh, breakout room doesn't show up. Sorry about that. That's, uh, that looks like that's me. So yeah, this will be another couple of minutes. We'll all join back, so because we are close to the uh, time. So since we are in this group, we can have a discussion. Sir. We can have a discussion. Yeah, it's great. The uh, 3MT is uh, great, and uh, Kiruba, yeah. And um, so Kiruba, how 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 do the students, uh, you know, relate to you know all these are very serious things you are talking about things, right? So you're almost like. Uh, 
mobilizing them to change the world. So, <laughs> so, so how do students react in the class to all these crises? So they connect with food because we all eat food. So when they see something like this and then they see, oh, what is the heat transfer? Like uh, you make a pancake, right? There is a heat transfer happening. Like, there are so many things that they could connect and uh, learning engineering principles becomes kind of interesting. By the end of the day, they like by the end of the semester, I see like they got, they could appreciate the engineering principles that goes behind making food safe and nutritious. Mm -hmm. That's great. Great, I like your examples of those uh, aircrafts. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm, I'm pretty simple-minded when it comes to how, how to teach a class, but I just find that if you show examples, instead of just textbook problems, boy students get much more engaged and excited. And we can all do it. We all teach, we all have different disciplines, but we all have interesting things, things that got us interested. So we should show that. We should show the students that. Yeah, and the things you listed at the end, you know, they seem obvious, but you know, they are essential. We all need to make sure we checklist those things. Yeah, I think it's certainly important to think about and talk about all these things we can do to improve teaching. Boy, I find, especially as undergraduate director, when I hear the complaints from students, it's oftentimes it's the simplest things that change. Show up on time, <laughs> be organized, talk to your students. They're just simple, simple things. The, the bar is so relatively low to be a good instructor, in my opinion. That's true. Maybe we'll hear this from this. I'm, I'm curious to hear this from the student panel, see what the students have to say. I, I don't think their expectations are, are so high. They just want basic, basic things. They really want to learn. I, I hear the same things as a director in chemical, Craig, that uh, if they just had the feedback that they simple feedback so that they could know what they were doing wrong, things would be a lot better. I think that that's the biggest thing I hear is that uh, just just work with them. Yeah, I'm, I'm hearing things this semester students are saying, we haven't got any feedback from any graded exams since September. I mean, that's I, just I had somebody came in and say, I didn't know my grade until the end, until we got back from Thanksgiving. Yeah, it's just unconscionable. I mean, that's what I'm saying. It's just such low, I hate to use cliches like low hanging fruit, such simple things that we can do to make students' lives better. Not to mention, cut down on the complaints. I mean, who needs all these, keep track of all these complaints and deal with them? Let's just do the basic stuff right. So I think I'll bring everyone back now. So they'll all join in 60 seconds. So there were about 10 or so in the online one, six or so in the traditional one. So that's good. So hopefully they had a good discussion. All right, we're all back. Um, so let's go with a, a brief uh, report back from the breakout. So Heather, you wanna go first? Sure, so we talked about um, just 
the the VR AR stuff and the um, I'm grade scope, honestly. And so it seems like um, those are both those are both things that people are really interested in. So it'd be great if we can see if we can apply the VR AR studios to other classes. And um, sounds like some people will be willing to try out grade scope, which any and all feedback will be appreciated. It's not a magic bullet, but if it makes life easier, um, I hope you guys will try it out. That's great. I'm glad we had both AR and VR. It would have been unfortunate if you only had one of those. <laughs> it's great. It's complete. <laughs> Roger, please go ahead. Sure. Uh, so we we tried to talk about all the presentations. Didn't have a lot of time, but uh, you know, uh, uh, talking about Feng Wang's uh, presentation, you know, relating to some simulated environments and things like that, uh, relates to the AR VR as well. But uh, seems like the bottleneck for that is creating the simulated environment, and so that that's the the time intensive task, but uh, effective nonetheless. Uh, we also talked a bit about uh, the peer review concepts that Jun Tuck uh, presented. Um, and uh, he's finding that uh, the, the, um, the students, uh, uh, through the discussion, we found that the students tend to take the peer review very seriously, you know, it was sort of compared to the journal review process, which uh, I noted there, there was a lot of apathy oftentimes in that process, but the students tend to take the, the peer review uh, aspect very seriously. So I think that's a nice element to add to a, a, a class for sure. Um, and uh, we kind of ran out of time <laughs> to talk about all the presentations in detail, but that that's uh, pretty much the, the the summary of the discussion. Yeah, like we said, it was a test of speed for everything in this session. So I think we got through it, you know, Roger. So we have a couple of minutes extra delay, but uh, back to you. Okay, great. Yeah, yield the time back. All right. Uh, so uh, uh, this next part is perhaps the most uh, exciting part. Uh, well, it's all exciting, but uh, I'm going to share my screen and you'll, you'll get the idea here. Uh, but the next uh, aspect of the program is the student panel discussion. That's to start, uh, uh, let's see it, uh, oh, we're late. <laughs> but that's okay. The students have been patiently waiting by there. I see they've filtered in uh, to the, the Zoom meeting, and that's great. Let me skip to the right uh, page here. Uh, we've got Drake, we've got Chloe, we've got Lauren. Uh, Drake Silvis uh, 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 is in chemical engineering. Chloe Jones is in computer science. And Lauren Hyde, uh, she's in IMSE, which uh, was too long for me to spell out, so I had to use an acronym. And, uh, and so I think the, uh, the outline of uh, this part of the discussion, we've got uh, roughly 45 minutes to do it, uh, is for each of them to speak briefly and talk about their sort of likes and dislikes in terms of uh, teaching and engineering, maybe focusing a little bit on, on the online aspects, but I think it's, it's wide open uh, for the discussion. And then uh, the really nice part about this is uh, we have uh, we're going to have time for uh, an extensive Q&A uh, to go along with this. And uh, so I think this will be a, a fun discussion. And uh, maybe what I'll do is uh, kind of, uh, is, is Drake in the meeting and, and pipe up if you are. I'm having a hard time seeing the, the gallery view. Uh, is Drake in here yet? Nope, no Drake. Um, and, but I think uh, I see saw both Chloe and Lauren, um, and maybe what we can do is we can, uh, you, you can decide, maybe Chloe can give her thoughts, uh, or Lauren, whoever wants to start on uh, uh, teaching, and uh, let me know if you need to share the screen or anything, but I don't think that'll, that'll be necessary. Uh, but, uh, um, you know, kind of give us your thoughts and we'll start the conversation that way. And I'll try to moderate uh, the, the chat um, board and, uh, and that, that should uh, work out uh, nicely. Um, who would like to start? <laughs> I can go first, Dr. Fails. Great. Great, Chloe, thank you. Thanks for this introduction and for, you know, setting this up and for all of you coming and listening to us. Um, I know that teachers are doing as best as they can right now. And I am president of engineering student council. So a lot of the times I'm trying to find that feedback from people. And I know it can sometimes be frustrating because students don't know all that goes into creating an online class and transitioning, but I also appreciate you guys listening to our concerns. So I am a student 
uh, in computer science. I am a junior and I've had really great teachers this semester. Um, some things that they have done that I've really appreciated are having group projects. So I think that especially in computer science has been really nice and a change from some earlier classes I took like freshman and sophomore year. So right now, obviously with everything being online, it's given me a chance to really interact with my classmates. Um, it kind of takes the pressure off feeling like you have to know everything because in the real world, you're gonna be able to work with a group and collaborate. So I think group projects are super awesome and would probably make it easier on you because you don't have to grade as many things either. <laughs> um, so that's definitely something I wanted to highlight. Um, I think another thing is I really appreciated that my teachers recorded lectures because then I was able to go back and maybe if like sometimes I feel a little nervous to like message a teacher, you know, you don't know if they'll always respond or if they'll be open to listening to your feedback. So like, it's really nice to be able to just go back and look at that stuff um, instead of reaching out to a teacher and then asking them a question that they addressed in class. And then that's not fun for anyone. <laughs> um, another thing is while like we're having those meeting meetings recorded, I've really liked how one of my teachers uses like polls and annotation on Zoom. So she'll have a, a slide up and it'll have an example problem. And then you can turn on the annotations on Zoom and students are able to draw on your screen, which could be a little dangerous, but it's worked out uh, <laughs> so far this semester. But I really like that because it's it keeps me engaged and also makes me think in class. So if I have a question on that problem or I'm clearly not understanding it, then I can just address that right there. Um, another thing, I think we're all just kind of figuring out like how to make things easiest online since it's so new. Um, one of my teachers, a suggestion I had just for like, honestly, I think everyone as we're going onto this virtual platform and utilizing Canvas more is making Canvas pages easy to use. Sometimes teachers don't have the assignments published, which like is a very simple fix, but like sometimes you just don't know because you don't know what the students are seeing. Um, I'm gonna pull up an example on Canvas. This is actually my um, public speaking class. So it's not engineering, but they have a really great platform that looks really nice and is easy to follow. So give me one second. Yeah, and I gave you the ability to share your screen too, Chloe, if you're gonna awesome. bring something up. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, while you're doing that, that that's an interesting thing. I've been guilty of uh, thinking I had something published, but it wasn't. <laughs> yes, I totally understand that. Um, this is something that I think would be kind of a big task for individual teachers, but maybe if we can get someone from like IT or something to do something like this. So this is just like, looks really nice. It has all of the assignments laid out right here. Um, you know, it's a, it has a cute little picture, has like the teacher's contact information. It's just like really easy to follow, has each week kind of laid out there. So I also like run a Canvas course for our organization and have kind of played around with it, but I think it would be really great if the engineering college could make that if we're moving on to virtual platform. Um, yeah, have a template. Oh, okay, so Heather said there is a template for the landing page, which is great, awesome. So yeah, I thought that was super helpful. And just making sure that you're letting your students know that you want them to reach out to you, maybe having like a mandatory office hour um, during the semester. One of my teachers did that and it's like, even if I didn't have any questions, I still felt like I wasn't burdening the teacher because it was just mandatory. And it also allows the teacher to kind of meet their students as well and make sure that everything is going okay during the semester. But I know we've all been very busy. So um, I think 
that might be all that I have to say. All right, uh, and I think feel free as we go along here to ask any questions. Uh, looks like Dr. Hunt, uh, who's been an excellent resource for us on anything uh, teaching and online, especially, you know, made that comment that Chloe brought up about the the template, and so she's uh, offering. It looks like uh, to make us aware of that. And I think that's <laughs> that's a really good comment. Uh, you know, the organization is key for this. Has been mentioned. Uh, boy, that the mandatory office hour thing. That that's a neat idea. I worry about uh, students sort of getting lost in the shuffle, and uh, by the time the semester is getting toward the end, this online has not really absorbed for them and they've not had any personal contact. And if you make that mandatory, what a, what a wonderful idea. It seems like a hassle at first, but I, I, I take your point about, uh, hey, there's the motivation, you know, to mm -hmm. get, get going with it. Yes. All right. Uh, so I think uh, let's let uh, Lauren go next and she can give us her rundown on her hits hit list for, for engineering education. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Fails. Um, if I haven't had a chance to meet you before, my name is Lauren Hyde. And like you said, I'm in the industrial engineering department. Um, I'm actually the vice president of student council. So I get to work with Chloe quite a bit. I'm gonna kind of consolidate what I wanted to mention just because I think Chloe hit on a lot of the high points already. Um, just kind of talking about the most important aspects I've noticed from a successful course is just interactive aspects, um, constant communications, just feedback in a timely manner. Like if we have an exam, I don't know, get it back within two to three weeks, some of them, take a little bit longer, we get that, but um, just, just feedback within a timely manner. I know Chloe already mentioned uh, flexibility in online learning methods. So this is like being able to go back and watch recorded lectures and seeing like, oh, I might've missed that. Just, just really, really helpful. You don't have to reach out to the professor every time you have a tiny, tiny question, so. And then the last thing I would say is just consistency. Consistency in, um, the course and just knowing what to expect, especially with the online method. Um, it's a lot easier to do things asynchronously if, if you have a consistent um, class structure. So yeah, I have tons of really great examples from my semester, but we can jump into questions, Dr. Fields, if you don't, if you want to go ahead and do that. Sure, yeah. And uh, um, you know, as we wait for the questions to come in, you're certainly welcome to, to add anything else. Uh, I think your point about the consistency, I mean, that that that's probably a, a really important one. You know, uh, you know, my own experience, uh, you know, if I, I do Tuesday, Thursday lectures this semester and between the Tuesday and Thursday, if I'm not quick enough to get my recorded lecture <laughs> uh, posted before uh, the, the next lecture comes around, I, I hear about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, pretty quickly. And so the students, uh, you know, it makes me feel good that they're actually listening to those recordings. But, uh, you know, one of the points you make, uh, you know, uh, has to do with, uh, you know, students access to these online courses. And, and I find that consistency is important uh, in getting things posted and, and, and not, uh, not making sure they're published is really important for the students who are maybe uh, able to attend one lecture during the week, but not the other because of their job, you know, in, in this time of COVID, I don't want to necessarily get in the way of students who are trying to hold down a job at the same time, you know, and, uh, and I, I try to anything that I, I present live is also recorded and then posted um, to where everyone has a chance at it. And so uh, definitely, uh, uh, you know, I'm not perfectly uh, punctual and getting everything posted sometimes, uh, but uh, the students have encouraged me to get better and better at that <laughs> over the semester. All right. Uh, so uh, looks like uh, there is at least some uh, messages on uh, the uh, the chat, and one of them is a direct message to me, and I'll, so I'll read it off. Uh, so it says, "What does mandatory office hour mean?" Uh, is it another hour that the students must attend? And I think Chloe, you had mentioned that. Maybe explain a little bit more about what's meant by the mandatory office hour. I think I kind of 
think I understood it, but mm -hmm. I'm not sure. So let, let, let's hear it. So what my teacher did is just one week, like before Thanksgiving break, she sent out a Google sheet she made of like each day um, the following week and time slots that she was open to meet with students. And then you'd just sign up for like an individual meeting with the teacher, but that could also be, you know, maybe like five students or like three students at a time. Um, and I just thought it was really helpful. Like I personally didn't have a ton of questions, but it just felt nice for like the teacher to reach out. And like you said, it might kind of seem sort of inconvenient, but I'm like ultimately happy that I did it because I got to meet the teacher that I had not seen face to face the entire semester. So um, yeah, that's pretty much just a way to yeah. meet. And I assume that the mandatory part is enforced by having some points attached to it. Is that right? Yes, yeah. it was like a 10 point assignment yeah. or something like that. So yeah, very good. Well, that, that's interesting. Uh, I think that's a nice idea. Um, you know, I, you know, I think we all hold regular office hours, but one in particular, there was a question that a lot of students had, but only a few in the office hours. So I, I went ahead and recorded the office hours, which I don't normally do because I want students to feel free to discuss, but I actually recorded my explanation and uh, posted it later, you know, with, with their permission. So uh, some students got to be guest star in one of my recordings for that. <laughs> All right, uh, let's see other questions. Uh, let's see, uh, Dr. Noble asks, uh, uh, what do you feel would be the best ways to increase student engagement when there are uh, when we are offering uh, our classes either online or in blended mode? And so that's a question for both Lauren and Chloe. Um, let's. I hear can it. take that one. So um, I really I do think the industrial engineering department does a great job at making the classes engaging, um, particularly Dr. Kim. I had him both last semester and this semester, and he does an incredible job of having in-class exercises, things that we can um, do as, like, by ourselves or as partners. And then um, I think he also does a great job of getting us to interact in class by just kind of forcing it like, hey, like, what do you think, Heather? And then, then Heather will have to respond to whatever it is. And, and I like it personally because I am much more engaged in the class. And I think that leads to better um, scores overall. So yeah, just a little thing. All right. And in moments like these, I, I'd like to ask if uh, Dr. Kim has a comeback for that. I mean, that was a big compliment. <laughs> and then I also want to make sure Dr. Noble doesn't feel bad because he didn't get a mention. <laughs> no, just kidding you, Lauren. I right. had my class yet, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good save. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, that's great. Um, and so uh, uh, looks like uh, Dr. Park uh, says, I do the mandatory meeting too. Um, that way you can reach out to shy students. And I think that's a good point. And, and that's, that's sort of the underlying issue. Uh, maybe to that comment, uh, uh, Lauren and Chloe, do you have any comments about how to reach the shy students in particular? Don't be shy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like this is just one of the problems that has, you know, been a problem since the beginning of like college is, I don't know why, but there's just some weird like shyness, or, like insecurity of like reaching out to a teacher. So I, I one, appreciate that um, you're doing the mandatory meetings. And I think that's a great way to reach out to shy students. Um, I think another thing is just being like an open and welcoming teacher and making sure like, you're like, if you guys wanna schedule a meeting with me, you know, please feel free to, like, I wanna talk to you guys. Um, Dr. Chan asked a question, like some of the most annoying instructor characteristics are like the instructors that you email and then they're like, why are you at like I, I I've gotten a response that's like you shouldn't be asking me this you should be asking the TA, um, which I know that instructors are super busy, but that just kind of like makes me shut down and I'm like okay I'm not gonna ask questions anymore because clearly you don't want to answer them so, um, 
that's one example is just like being open, being like nice, being approachable to students, definitely, because just giving a little nudge. I think what Lauren said too is like calling out students in Zoom, although that might sound terrifying. Um, like students will go to class if you are engaging with them in class. And if they know that if you, they're not there, like they'll miss something or they'll be called on and maybe not be um, like if you turn your camera off and you're sleeping during class or something like the teacher calls on you, they'll know. So mm -hmm. I think those are good ways to get students engaged. You, uh, that, that's an interesting point about the, the cameras and the calling on an engagement. Um, that's one thing that, uh, I, I wonder if I, um, sometimes I'm tempted to ask the students to, sh you know, show themselves on camera, but I, I, I never do. And, uh, and the reason I do that is, you know, everyone has a, you know, a bad day and they just don't want to be, a, um, a spectacle <laughs> on the zoom, I guess, uh, you know, I've had those too, I'm sure. But, uh, you know, what, what do you think about the, this dynamic of some students will show themselves on the camera and some won't, uh, what are we to make of that? And, uh, you know, should there be any encouragement to kind of show yourself, uh, to kind of get that face to face going or, uh, uh, but my, my thought on is it's probably, you don't want to force that at all, but what, what do you, uh, students well, think about that? I'll just take a quick comment on it. Um, mm -hmm. Requirements on that, it should be kind of a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. Like I know if it's offered in advance is like, if you turn on your camera next time and you'll get bonus points or something because, oh, we have a speaker coming in. I think that's a very, um, very okay case to do that. Mm -hmm. I, I would say um, it should be required on exams just because you're going to be looking at whether or not they're trying to cheat, obviously. But um, other than that, I, it should just be whether or not the student feels comfortable. So that's, that's my personal opinion. Very good. And uh, uh, Roger, I have a question. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Slam. So I have noticed that when I ask students in the class, online cl lectures, a question, uh, some of them respond in the chat box. They don't want to speak out. So my guess is they may be taking the class in the library or in some places where they cannot speak out. Uh, so uh, forcing the students to answer the questions or talk to us or even showing their face may not be always possible. So that's my two cents. Yeah, absolutely. I've I've encountered that as well. Um, the students in the library and uh, and either they have to keep it down or 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 limit it to just chat. And I think yeah, that's always seems quite reasonable. You just have to be aware of that, and, uh, and it's not always clear the reason a student participates in in a certain way. I think. Yeah, and those questions like whether you should ask them to turn their camera on are those are really hard to answer because mm -hmm. like I definitely appreciate the flexibility right now but at the same time like when you really break it down and think about it like everyone this semester is unless you're teaching a, a like online class that is usually online like we're kind of expecting and we're paying for like in-person classes so I feel like mm -hmm. I don't know you just kind of have to ponder like are we going to make this like a real life class? Because if it was a real life class, then technically computers should be on like whatever. So like you would be there in person, your face would be there. So I don't really know. Those are hard questions and definitely case by case, which isn't a great answer. But I think yeah. as long as, you know, I think a chat is okay. Or like as long as the student is at least engaging if you call on them um then that like shows that they're paying attention at least yeah yeah I, i've got to say from my own point of view i really appreciate when the students put something in the chat and i'm really um happy to see that and i think that's a, a more than adequate alternative to actually speaking out um, i think some people are just you know a little nervous about speaking in front of the whole class too just like they are in person and and i think chat actually adds a little something uh, that we, you know, it, it increases or, or allows some people to speak out in class that wouldn't speak out, you know, out loud. <laughs> yeah. And 
utilizing like playing videos during the lectures or because like sometimes if I don't understand something in the class it's nice to like you can look up pretty much anything on YouTube like looking up a tutorial on YouTube about different algorithms like they explain them really well or um, utilizing like Kahoot is great like and fun to do to kind of quiz the students during class so I think just a lot of the times if you're just lecturing and like on a slide show it, it can become very like mundane and you start to just like get distracted or tune tune it out so doing something different is nice all right uh let's see i've actually got a burning question in my mind that i've always wanted to know about uh, from a student's point of view when i'm doing a lecture sometimes i get chat that uh, that i can see <laughs> but i would imagine that uh, the students chat uh, do direct message to one another and uh, i would imagine that that would be very constructive in many cases but uh, uh, to what extent uh, have you, uh, Lauren and Chloe, experienced uh, you know direct chat, and uh, and and maybe you can tell us how many times you've made fun of the professor using uh, direct messaging. <laughs> okay, oh boy, um, I guess I'll go first. <laughs> I will say I think direct chats used a lot more in like student org meetings. I know I'll message people all the time because I don't want to call them out um, in front of everyone, be like, hey, put in your updates or or that sort of thing, or or just like, hey, how how have you been? Kind of. I will say in the classroom, I don't use chat as much just because I am trying to stay focused mm -hmm. on like what the teacher's talking about. Occasionally I'll message someone and be like, hey, have you started the homework for tonight? Like normally and <laughs> Normally, it is pretty constructive from my point of view, but um, maybe maybe Chloe has something else to add. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've definitely experienced like people not talking about class stuff. Um, I personally thought that the teachers could, like after the Zoom, that you would get the chats. So like, I was just scared to do. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I've actually wondered that myself. Uh, these direct messages, I, I honestly don't know of a way that I could get um, a transcript of the chat that's uh, the, the direct message part of it. So I've not seen that. Now, okay. I can't promise that that's not possible. Uh, but uh, so far, I haven't seen a way to do that. And I think that's good because, you know, you'd like to have direct, direct uh, yeah communication without fear of it being recorded or something. Right. And, so, uh, so and theoretically, <laughs> the Zoom administrators can see all of that, but the Zoom administrators don't really care. Um, yeah. And I don't think we've, like, I think the only time that they would ever, like, this is a privacy issue, and I think the only time a Zoom administrator would be willing to divulge that is if there was, like, a legal case and there was an actual, like, formal legal information request that went on, like, if there was a harassment issue or something like that. Um, but, yeah, like, no, no normal, like, I can't see it, no normal instructors could see the direct message, like, that it, it's held somewhere else and you have to have, like, very specific things to get access to that. So like an instructor couldn't just say like, what did my students say today in direct message? That's, that wouldn't be approved. Just, just so everybody knows. Um, it's on so the so internet, so never assume that it's private. Yeah. Okay. You, you know, Roger, it, it would be great if uh, students were direct messaging each other during class because that's oh, yeah. the engagement that we want in building the community, you know? That's a really interesting question. I'm really surprised, you know, students don't do that more. Maybe that's something as we professors should encourage. And say like what Heather said, where it's like we do not see the direct message. So mm -hmm. feel free to direct message each other during the, you know, the, the lecture, you know, to have that engagement. That's I, really think, so, I find that mine are talking about the class. But I have another a, a question that Johannes brought up, and that is uh, in the classes I teach, there's a lot of group work, or it's so hard you can't do it on your own in the amount of time. And the students use some teamwork software that I'm, I have no access to, don't want to have access to, but I encourage people to put their main questions up on the discussion board and they don't. 
And so what's happening, what I found out, you know, just this past week is they're getting help from people who are telling them the wrong things. How, how do you, <laughs> how do you, how do you encourage students to, to take those main, those things that Johannes was talking about that bubble up to the top that I need to address so that students understand these fairly difficult concepts and they never get to me and they get to the test and <laughs> they're doing the same wrong thing over and over and over, just like the bad golf swing that they've been practicing and practicing and practicing. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And I'd like to hear what Lauren and Chloe have to say. And after that, there, uh, we'll have another question from Dr. Zhang. Um, yeah, what, what of uh, the, I think the, the blind leading the blind aspect of, uh, you know, uncontrolled, uh, you know, communication between students that that applies for uh, non online as well. But uh, what, what do you uh, two have to say about that, Lauren and Chloe? So yeah, if I understood the question, correctly, I believe that the mo the best way to mitigate that would be constant feedback. I don't know when they turn in their assignments or how you grade them. I gr they turn them in every class and they're returned by the next class. I have, I have a lot of homework, a lot of short stuff, but it's hard. And so they get feedback and then they get to do it. If they got it wrong, they get to do it again for full credit. But <laughs> it, it just, the um, it, it made it grading online has been harder for the graders, but we haven't um, we haven't lost that. But there are some concepts they're just not getting. You would think that that feedback would mitigate those those <laughs> recurred issues. Um, I I have no no real suggestion, um, but the feedback is what I look at the most, and that's that's just why I asked. Yeah, I don't know if you know maybe. There's, there's such a like interesting balance because I feel like high school, it's like the teachers like are really guiding you because you're younger and you haven't been out in the real world. And some people are just like, don't know what's going on. But in college, it's like, there's a balance between the students taking initiative because we are adults um, and teachers taking initiative. So if you don't think it's like too much of an initi initiative, like post, like on that discussion post, maybe like, hey, on all these homeworks, I've been seeing this happen. But again, like, ultimately, you're doing all you can. And if the students, like, clearly aren't getting it or aren't engaged, you know, sometimes there, there's definitely some self like responsibility that students have to hold with their because it's their education. So their grade. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, that's yeah, and maybe part of it is trying to make those uh, sort of uh, hosted discussion boards more attractive in some way to the students. Do um, you guys have any thought thoughts about that? I really like formula sheets too. Like if it's a formula they're getting wrong, those are really nice. I don't know if that's like too guided too, but that's always just because you know if you get the formula wrong, then you're kind of screwed. So you can just find those anywhere. Yeah, yeah, one one false move on a formula, and uh, and you flunk Dr. Meyer's class. This is not a good situation. Not the formula is okay. It's, it's the process of, of problem solving and applying them to uh, things that they haven't seen. The the formulas usually aren't the problem. It's just uh, it's real engineering. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. Um, Dr. Zhang, uh, as a professor in mechanical and aerospace engineering, uh, asks, do you prefer live via Zoom or pre-recorded lecture via Penopto and maybe some other tools like that? I can go ahead and give my two cents on this. So I definitely depends on what you're trying to get out of the course. I've had I had three classes a semester that were live lectures via Zoom, then recorded and posted on um, online, which was super helpful. And then um, another one that was pre recorded via Panopto. And um, I liked the pre recorded one quite a bit because I could move ahead. I could, like, everything was released. I could just work on it all at once. And I've, I've been done with that class for a while at this point. And so that was really, really helpful uh, this semester, at least. But I think uh, in terms of the other ones, I think I had more of a community in the live lectures, the via Zoom ones. I knew who else was in the class. Mm -hmm. uh, we had projects that we had to work on together. I think that if you're really looking to um, 
encourage engagement, that's that's the method you need to go with a live lecture via Zoom. Um, if you're fine with, okay, they get the material, it's probably less work for you because you just post it all at once. You don't have to record, then post an announcement or on Zoom. Um, really depends. I, I think students can succeed both ways, but depending on your course, um, I would go with the live lecture, honestly, via Zoom. Yeah, I would, just to add to that, um, I really liked, if you're doing a live lecture, like having it recorded so you can go look back, um, but like, yes, it is nice to work ahead in classes, you know, depending on what you want to get out of it, but from my experience and from like just seeing some of my friends um, and their experiences in classes, like if you want students to be engaged, if you want them to like watch the lecture, like for, make sure that they're watching the lectures, like I think live Zoom and then recording that, posting it online is great because I found it was nice just to have like some sort of structure right now. Like I knew that I would have a Zoom Monday, Wednesday, Friday from like one to three um or else you know you have all these videos online and then you have to kind of construct your own schedule and a lot of the times that is like ever changing and then you kind of lose track and then you just stop watching the lectures and that's never good so i i second that more and like i really liked having a live lecture and then having that recorded and put on a uh, canvas yeah, that's that's an interesting comment about the the sort of structure of your life. I think uh, I've had a, a few students kind of run into issues with that. Um, on, on a side note, there was an earlier discussion about the speed of playback. All right, I got a couple of questions with that. What's the fastest speed of playback, like one times, two times, three times that you've played a lecture? And what's the fastest you think you can actually understand what's going on in the lecture? <laughs> so, yeah. Chloe, let's hear it. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm sure we have Chloe. similar like answers to this. I mean, I've definitely put a lecture on two times speed. Yeah. And if there's a concept that I'm missing, like I'll pause it and write it down and like dive deeper into it. But it just makes me feel like I'm utilizing my time better if I put it in two times speed so that I can, you know, maybe cut down an hour long lecture into like 30 minutes with that. But some teachers speak really fast too. So it just, yeah, two times is definitely what I've done. <laughs> two times, okay. Yeah, Very similar. I've done two times, which is the max, um, just because if there's, if it's a second time I'm seeing something, normally it, I don't need to spend as much time on it. And um, if it's the first time I'm watching it, I'll just keep it at, at one or 1 1.25 or something. But um, if you're going through material again, I, I don't think you need to stop and pause at every every word or every note on the board. So very good. Yeah, that, that seems to match up with some of the, the research and what, what people have found students are doing. Very cool. All right. So I'm gonna look at the chat again and see if there are any questions bubbling up there. Nothing yet. Um, let's see. One got of my teachers, like he plays music at the beginning of lectures, which I think is kind of fun. Like, yeah. it's definitely cheesy, but I'm like, you know, it's something different. And I get to know that he was like in a heavy metal band or something like when he was younger, which it, it's, I'm like tapping into my subconscious right now. Cause it's like, during these classes, I'm like, eh, I don't know, like that's kind of weird. But then I'm like, well, it's memorable. And I get to know him and, we all kind of have that funny like oh remember that teacher who would like always do this mm -hmm. um which is kind of fun now i know some of the ground rules was not to name names necessarily but let's hear it chloe who, who are we talking about uh, dr your chick <laughs> okay he's, yeah <laughs> he's great he does a really good job yeah well if, if you were mechanical engineering you i would have guessed Kluver, but yeah Hey, I, I just started doing that. I just the other day I played a, a Rolling Stones song before my lecture because my wife does it. My wife's an English professor. She does a Zoom lecture and she'll run in my office. What song shall I play before the my my lecture? So I'll, I'll tell her and then I'll go watch her song. So. 
Man, I've been doing this for years. The last decade in my face-to-face -face teaching. <laughs> Same. Same. You're I, all ahead of the curve. <laughs> I, I do it too. And face-to-face, -face, I'll bring up a YouTube video about some band I like and I'll show it before the class. So I, I do that all the time. Too. Except I was playing Pandora once in the background as the class started. And it's like, I forgot to turn it off. And so we had like <laughs> random music playing as I, that was embarrassing. <laughs> Make sure to turn it off. Very good. Yeah. And I think Chloe mentioned teaching or uh, cheesy uh, items in lecture. Uh, and I feel like that's a necessary, necessary ingredient for every lecture is to have something cheesy in there. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, looking at the chat, not seeing any other questions. We've got a few more minutes. Uh, if there's some other questions or comments uh, from uh, Lauren and Chloe. I All right, looks like we've got uh, Drake in the meeting as well. Uh, Drake, uh, would you like to give us uh, your rundown on hits and misses? Uh, we've been having a nice discussion uh, from the student point of view. I think Drake's there. Let's see if I can uh, bring him up here. I think someone had a question too. Okay. Yeah, yeah, let's, uh, was there a question? That was me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I'm kind of curious, right, about, um, I guess this is your personal experience as well as maybe what you've heard other students talk about as far as the design of online courses. And I guess the design of the delivery of it, right? Like, do you prefer having one document that guides you through a module or do you prefer several different pages that you click on to go through a module or does it even matter? Um, I like having one document that guides me through a module because sometimes it can just be hard to keep track of all those things in your head. Um, using the calendar too for assignments that are due, that's really helpful because it's easy to miss an assignment if it's not on the Canvas calendar. Um, but yeah, I would say one document. So one of my teachers, this, is, this isn't engineering, but um, she like has weekly modules kind of similar to what I showed you guys. And then in the module, she has just like week overview and you click on that and she'll have like, this is what you're doing this week. You know, watch this video, answer this discussion post um, and then do this assignment. So I think that's nice. Very cool. All right. How about uh, turning in assignments? Uh, one thing that uh, I've been kind of thinking about is whenever we get back to uh, uh, in-person courses, um, I think we'll end up with a mix of online and in-person once we, you know, things return to, uh, you know, post-COVID, I guess. Um, what are the thoughts about continuing to turn in assignments by scanning and uploading and, and or whatever method for turning them in that we're using now? Any, any thoughts on, on you know, mechanisms for turning in assignments and maybe keeping some of those after we're not, uh, when, when, whenever we're on face-to-face uh, -face courses? I mean, I don't know if I've ever turned in an assignment by hand except for maybe on my study abroad course, um, just because he was just like, yeah, turn it in after class. And that was basically the method. Um, so I, I would say that I've always turned in uh, assignments with the electronic submission or, or done um, some sort of cam scanner um, submission, so. All right, very good, yeah. Yeah, I, um, just to kind of add to that, so I, will usually just take a photo on my phone and then like upload it to my computer. And there's a lot of websites that will like um, convert like JPEGs or like, you know, different photos to PDFs. So maybe having that as a resource to students if they're kind of having trouble with that is good. But I mean, cam scanner, yeah, is a good one. I, I don't really think I have problems with that, but another thing, another comment, Drake texted me and said that his power went off and reset his alarm clock. So okay. 
<laughs> no problem. Text him back. It's okay. Uh, yeah, I understand. Uh, you know, uh, and uh, I thought uh, the responses to this were were in interesting. This, uh, you know, how to hand in things. I've exposed myself. I think the the term is luddite, um, as a, sort of a low tech person. I I have exclusively had things handed in on paper. Uh, you know, up until. Uh, March of this year. <laughs> and, uh, and so it's interesting to hear Lauren, I think made the comment that that she had never turned anything in paper except for maybe this, this uh, uh, study abroad experience. So that that's interesting to hear. Uh, yeah. Um, and Dr. Hunt's comment about upload everything minimizes paper cuts. And I have to say, I've truly enjoyed uh, the grading process with speed grader. That uh, basically means I can grade on my iPad with my little pen and uh, and it can be done anywhere. And so <laughs> it's, it's very nice. I don't have a stack of papers getting more and more dog eared in my backpack as I grading process goes on. Okay, um, with that, uh, if there's any more burning questions, maybe we could do one more, but that would put us behind. But uh, um, if, if there are, just let me know. But I want to make sure we we thank uh, Lauren and Chloe and uh, and Drake for helping uh, organize this as well. And uh, this is really appreciated uh, doing this first ever um, student panel uh, with our symposium. Thank you very much for doing this. And I think those were very thoughtful comments from both the audience and, and from uh, Lauren and, and Chloe. All right. Thank you and so bye. much. And if you guys have any questions, like Lauren and I are both, like we, we work together a lot, Dr. Fails. So like, feel free to shoot us questions and we can Kind of gauge what the student body is thinking so very good very valuable feedback thank you very much all right uh so um the uh i'll bring us back to the powerpoint presentation here and we'll have another look at the program uh and so our next step is the Kemper Fellow panel. And so that's the start at 11.30. We're, I think, about two minutes behind, so not too bad. Um, we've had some excellent discussions so far. And so what I will do next is I will introduce our Kemper Fellows. And if I've left anybody out who's a Kemper Fellow who's here, please let me know. Uh, but our three uh, um, uh, speakers that we have set up for today are Dr. Paul Chan, and uh, he was made a Kemper Fellow way back in 1993, and so some time ago. Uh, but um, uh, the next one is Dr. Craig Cleaver, who is the very newest uh, Kemper Fellow in our, our college. Uh, um, he got the award in 2020, and I remember that day because the, the chancellor slash president was uh, running around campus with uh, a camera and an entourage, and so that was kind of funny to see. Uh, and then uh, uh, Dr. Honeysling could not be here and he sends his apologies. He had uh, um, sort of a last minute issue with respect to uh, uh, having a meeting with a funding agency. So he's not able to join us today. Uh, but uh, um, I, I think we can have a, a nice conversation uh, uh, with uh, um, Dr. Chan and uh, Dr. Cleaver. Uh, Paul and Craig can kind of lead lead us uh, maybe on a, a little bit of a, um, a initial discussion, and then we can have a Q&A to follow. I think uh, the Q&A with the student panel was excellent, so that's going to be hard to follow up, uh, but I'm, I'm sure you guys can do it. And so uh, Dr. Cleaver and Dr. Chan, would one of you like to start by uh, speaking a little bit about uh, what you do and your thoughts on teaching, maybe the online aspects of it, and then, uh, and then move on to the next? Well, I'm the I'm the definitely the wrong guy to talk about online because I've never, I mean, I haven't taught a class for the past year. So and, and so, whatever happened after uh, March 2020 has, uh, I have no experience with at least uh, not in the teaching setting. Uh, uh, Craig, you have. Uh, it, I, I have very, as I showed in my three minute thesis, I've got very little experience with online teaching other than what we were forced into in March. And then of course this semester, this semester has mostly been hybrid for me, as I pointed out. Um, I wanted to maintain face-to-face -face teaching 
And I got to do that for what, uh, 13 weeks. But I had to adapt and do some online, as I mentioned, Panopto videos that I would pre-record. What I think is the boring stuff. And I think that's, as the students, I think they probably left, but as they indicated, you can go through that at double speed, especially I talk slowly. So go through that double speed, get the, the important parts you need. And then I like to focus classes on actually working problems. One thing I, I did this semester that I've never done before is, uh, as Roger pointed out, used one of um, these things, these, uh, you know, pen, stylus pen on a laptop. Yeah. And I, you know, talk about Roger, he thinks he's a Luddite. I am the biggest Luddite and everybody would probably give a thumbs up to that. <laughs> the Zoom response. But I figured out how to do that with one note. I know I don't have that. <laughs> but with one note and being able to import a picture, you know, with the text that outlines a problem, and then you scroll down the page and actually work it out by hand. That's really worked out well. Um, so that's one thing I, I plan on keeping. I'm getting off topic a bit. This is, um, I'm just sharing things that I've, I found have worked this semester. So it, it sounds to me like Craig and, and myself teach kind of the same way that we want to work things uh, at the moment. Uh, rather than having something all set up, uh, you know, PowerPoint, whatever. So, um, you know, I find out that when I teach, um, I don't mind getting stuck in class, you know, in a face-to-face -face class, uh, because I, I like the students to, uh, to see how I think, maybe, and how I work through a problem, which is very important in, in chemical engineering. So, uh, you know, many times I just uh, go in and, and, you know, it's probably the same way uh, in an online or, or, or Zoom type lecture as well, that, you know, I would work something that, a, a problem that I am totally not, you know, I don't have anything set up. I haven't worked that problem five minutes before class, nothing like that. I just go in and take my chances and, and and take my shots, so to speak. And if I get stuck, uh, there's usually a learning experience for the student as well. I think that's a really good point. That's something I do a lot. I, I don't like to read PowerPoints. I think that's, and students, as undergraduate director, I hear that all the time. Students are totally bored by that. So all of us, anybody listening, don't read your PowerPoints. It's boring. What, what I do, what I, I think Paul does this too, is in a class, you open up, you try to get engagement, you try to open up a discussion and you say, okay, I just presented this topic in system dynamics, any questions? And someone, someone will, that's paying attention will say, well, what, a, what about this issue? And right there you go, I go to the blackboard or with the, the what's that thing called? The Elmo camera and I, draw by hand and show it on in the classroom, I just make up a problem. And you try to ad address it right there and show them a concept with a simple example. So I, I encourage everybody to do something like that. And that's what I enjoy about teaching a class. And, and, and you, I think we can do this online. We can do this with uh, you know, the stylus and the laptop and, and work problems on the fly. And I think students like that. They like to see immediate response to their questions. And I think circling back to uh, one of the uh, earlier discussion, whether uh, the students prefer a uh, an online lecture to be uh, um, all prepared, or whether it's uh, uh, you know synchronous versus asynchronous. Maybe that's uh, one way of saying it. Uh, it. It actually depends on whether the instructor uh, likes to do PowerPoint. If you do PowerPoint, there's no point to do synchronous. Come on. I mean, you, I think you can just, uh, in my view anyway, and, and, and Heather, if you disagree, please correct me because I'm inexperienced. Uh, you know, if you're going to read from the PowerPoint, you might as well just do it asynchronous and let the students take the time to do whatever they want. So it depends on how you teach. And uh, one of the things that I, ve I was very surprised to hear uh, from the keynote speaker was that he thinks he's a better instructor 
uh, in a face-to-face -face, uh, traditional setting than in an online setting. I was very surprised to hear that. Yeah, I thought that was interesting as well. Uh, this this issue of uh, making mistakes and uh, and treating that as sort of a learning experience. Uh, I'm uh, probably the king of the sign error in lecture, and <laughs> and I find that 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 generally generates at least a few student comments <laughs> when I uh, drop a negative sign. I think it's a good thing though, Roger, because it shows they're paying attention, and if they can see, oh, you drop. You made a sign error here because F equals MA got rearranged and mm -hmm. then they're paying attention. They can actually learn something. Yeah. I I did um, in 2018, we just published a study that came out this year, which was fortuitous. In 2018, I, I felt I traumatized my students. They knew ahead of time before they signed up for the class, but we did um, both online and in seat and then there were two sections and so one group started online and then finished the last eight weeks in seat and then the other group did it the opposite way so that we could use them as their own controls. We did that in 2018 and I was so like going back to your comments about Johannes said he was a better instructor um, in person. I actually think I'm a better online instructor. <laughs> um, but during that study, it was so interesting to me um, how the students, they liked the in-person stuff, but then the students who started in person and went online were like, oh, the freedom, the freedom. And the other students were like, how dare you take away my flexibility and accessibility? This is terrible. I don't want to come in and listen to you. <laughs> I was like, sorry. <laughs> um, but, but one of the cool things about doing the asynchronous, or at least having the videos in Canvas Analytics, you can go in and you can see how often students are accessing your videos. And so um, that was actually when I when I switched to online for one of my undergrad classes, it was actually the first time I saw how troublesome one of my units was. Um, and I was able to add a bunch of extra content, but students were rewatching this 15 minute segment like it was an average of six times per student. Right. I mean, my students fly through it definitely double speed, um, but they were coming back to this one segment over and over and over and over again and rewatching. And it was so interesting to have those analytics on that. And so then I put in a lot more content around that little segment and suddenly it got a lot better the next year. You could see they were, they were accessing the other stuff and watching that initial segment a lot less. There's some cool things that you can do when you have that data. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah, I need to take more advantage of uh, the data that that I can use uh, from that um, Canvas sort of tracking activity. I think that's uh, definitely an, an untapped resource for me. <laughs> and this, uh, uh, Craig, uh, I recall uh, you mentioning this before, and I know uh, um, uh, Steve Lombardo is not on the the Zoom meeting, so I'm not going to give him a, a big head over this. But uh, you had mentioned sort of a gold standard associated with uh, what homework to assign and how much to grade and things like that. Um, could, would you mind briefly uh, talking about that for the benefit of the group here? Yeah, I, I don't know if I can exactly uh, characterize how Steve Lombardo does it for his thermodynamics class, but let's be clear, he's, he's teaching a very large lecture class with maybe 100 students, thermodynamics, sophomore level. And he basically assigns problems that may be the end of the chapter, textbook problems, but he doesn't give them a lot of weight. He make, makes it more of a participation kind of points. You do the work, you turn it in, and you get a check. And I've kind of adopted that for my system dynamics class. I, I give them end of chapter problems, well, they got the answers. You can just Google it, you'll find the answers. But they're not graded. The TA will just look at it and, okay, did they do the six or seven problems? Did they make a, a decent attempt? If they did, they get a, a one or a zero. It's a binary grade. And I tell them up front, this is only going to be 10% of your grade. But if you at least make attempts to do the homework, you'll get 10%. And nobody should not get 10%. And then I'll post the solutions and you can see how the, the problems actually work. What I hear from students is they complain that professors will say, okay, homework from the back of the textbook into the chapter problems 
it's 35% of your grade and it's all just copied work and they get 35%. So that's, I think that's Lombardo's method. And I think it's a good one. I think the kind of de-emphasize, but give it some effort, um, some weight for effort. Another thing that Steve does with homework is that he, he kind of does it like the professional sports these days. The players can either opt in or opt out. That's right. That's another key feature. I forgot about that. That's right. So could you explain the opt-in and opt-out a little bit, uh, Paul or, or Craig? Craig? Oh, go ahead, because I, I don't remember exactly. I mean, all it does is if, uh, at the beginning of the semester, the, uh, Steve uh, gives the students an option of either opt-out, which means they don't turn in any homework. And, uh, and I guess the percentage-wise, percentage homework doesn't count towards the denominator. Uh, and if you opt in, then you do as Craig just described, you have turned it in regularly and uh, you got checked off or haven't done it. And hopefully yeah. you are not copying. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think this, not to belabor the point, but this whole issue of cheating and copying um, exams, I, I came from the, our industrial advisory council meeting was this morning. It's why I wasn't part of the, earlier sessions and I was talking to them about because I did exit interviews and students that are graduating in MAE are telling me cheating is rampant in mechanical engineering. Old exams, old projects, old homework, they just recycle it, they send each other files and we got to do something about that and just to turn a blind eye and not not to even acknowledge that it's there is just the wrong thing to do so we got to do something. So and, and Part of it, Heather would probably have a lot of good suggestions for how to mix things up, but I think it comes down to at least the way I approach it is, I just don't, I've never recycled exams. You got to ask things differently. You've got to just redo new problems. So. Yeah. Maybe Heather's got some input. Yeah. Um, so so there's, a, there's a good page up on Keep Learning, and I'll put it in the chat about how to reduce cheating that's based on based on the literature and research in the area. And, and the gist is that the more you make something a high priority, like a high grade point, like a high percentage, the higher the risk you're gonna have of cheating. And it's, it's, it's one of those, like there's this threshold where even the best students, the ones who you know, you'd think would never ever do it, they feel this compelling urge, like it becomes reasonable to cheat in their mind because it's such a big part of their grade. And so really people are talking about, you need to have more types of assessments that are worth much smaller point values um, so that no one assessment is so compelling, like doesn't give them this compelling reason like, oh, maybe I should, everybody else is cheating and I'm just gonna, you know. And, and then of course, like things like don't grade on a curve. Grading on a curve promotes cheating because everyone's like, well, everyone else is doing it. I've got to do it just to, to keep my grade up, which I don't think many of us grade on a, on a curve already. Um, but doing those smaller assessments that are worth lower point values and doing more of them um, has been proven to actually work. Um, with exams, like I, I started, I got good advice when I started to never ever allow my students to keep the exams. And so they would get their exams back in class and they could look at them, but by the time they left the door, they had to hand them back to me. Um, so this spring, I had to uh, change that and it was the first time that I've, they, they got to keep a copy of their exam because it was on Canvas on a speed grader. They uploaded it. Um, I will have to rewrite all of my exams. And, and I know that. Um, but that's what I'm willing to do to honor the students who came before and put the work in and, and didn't cheat. And I'm willing to do that. So. Now, um, I, um, I think that's pretty standard for a lot of instructors that the students don't get back the old exams. Uh, and I, I'm just going to present my uh, version of you know how I do things a little differently. And Drake is already laughing. Um, I give students uh, my entire test file from the Civil War. So, uh, and uh, you know it, it is so huge that. Uh, you know, if you if you study the whole thing and and have everything recited by heart, uh, you're good to go no matter what I say. And uh, if it is a closed book, 
uh, exam, uh, I likely, in, if I have three questions, I'll take two from the test file and I will have one new one uh, uh, just for kicks. So if you study the whole uh, file, you probably will get a B. And if you uh, are you know, smart to get the new problem, you'll make an A. So that's how I do it. It's a little different from everybody else. Uh, if it is a, an open book exam, then I don't even give them the uh, answers. So they have to work out the answers themselves. I think that's a key. And that's something I, I've heard from students also with exit interviews is they say, the exams are out there and then Professor X just recycles the exam and it's an open book exam. So they just pull out the exam and they just read off the answers and write them down. So I like Paul's idea, but don't make it open book. And what I do is I, I give an exam and I give them an equation sheet. I get to choose the equation sheet. They, I post it on Canvas. They get to see it ahead of time and they know what equations they're going to get and the rest is closed book. So, and I, I don't recycle exams anyway, but the, that's one way to try to minimize it. Very good. Um, I noticed that uh, Drake is uh, on the meeting now, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, Drake, but let us know how, how often you cheat on exams and how do you do it? Or maybe what you've seen. <laughs> well, I don't think I cheated on exams since the time I um, got to Mizzou, but I've seen a lot of different exams like a lot of different uh, ways to attempt to improve your grade and exams and stuff or like creative solutions from people, but not a good thing to do. I like the way Dr. Chan did it actually. The um, having a huge like <clears throat> reference file to draw from in terms of like exams. It, it's interesting because you have all these different examples of problems, but I remember when I took Dr. Chan's class, you used to have all of these um everyone would always be like, oh, I bet he'll ask us one like this on there. You know, like, oh, he's always got one like this on there. He's got to ask us one like this on there. So um, it was like we were almost more motivated to like study the types of problems he had on the exam because obviously we knew we were like, okay, well, Dr. Chan's not recycling his exam. There's no way he's recycling the exam. He's got to look at all these exams. They got like ones from like, you know, early 90s in here. Um, but it, it gave us a like different way to study for it and prep for it. So I don't know. I really like the way Dr. Chan did it, actually. It was probably like one of my favorite ways. I remember Dr. Myers would never give us our test back. Like we could always like we could always go and um, look at the exam if we wanted to and like see what we did wrong. But like we could never take it back with us. And honestly, that worked really well, too. All right. Dr. Myers was giving you the stink eye for just a second there, but I think you saved it. Oh, in the end. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> there good. is no one single good way uh, to do tests. Whatever is comfortable, and but you know you just have to uh, do things that are intelligent and logical, and you know think about all the possibilities that that students can take unfair advantage of the situation. I'd like to add aligned with what you tried to teach them, Paul which is something as a director of undergraduate studies, I get comments about a lot. If I could add one more thing, um, one thing I found that works for me, so I've, I've mentioned don't recycle exams, don't recycle projects and homework, and then, then it's on you to come up with all these problems. One thing, and Roger and I both teach system dynamics. One thing I'll do is you'll talk about a topic and then the assignment is, okay, two person team, you go out and search the engineering literature, find an example that we just talked about. You define the constraints for your problem. You define what you're gonna work on and then you solve it and turn it into me. So it's like you, you create the problem, turn it in and I'll determine if you did a good job. Um, so that, that there's no recycling there that because it's totally open ended. So I found that that works not all the time, not in every case. You don't want to do that for every problem. But um, and as Heather said, I think it's not another important point. We don't do one big project for the class. We do I, I do these projects. I, I do four of them, maybe or five of them every two weeks. So they're kind of smaller scale projects. So yes, yeah, so one's not worth. 45% of your grade, they're worth 
15 percent. The, the, the uh, discussion of, of projects came up earlier. I want to ask the question, but I didn't have a chance. And Drake is here, so I'm going to put him on the spot. You know, uh, how do you like your instructors to assign project groups? I think that's probably, that's that's a really hard question to answer just as a general thing, because like, Project groups can go good or bad, and I don't really think there's a way to like know ahead of time if I'm in like a, I guess what I would call a good project isn't one that you get like 100% like everything. It's one where like you at least have people who will work with you and like, you know, you can work alongside them. Mm -hmm. um, I have liked it before in project groups when I have the opportunity to choose my group, but that's been in classes where like I kind of know people and such, which like in the core chemical engineering, not uh, chemical engineering courses, you know, as you go through, like you do know more people. So choosing people for like unit operations this semester was like a pretty easy task. Um, but when it comes to like blindly assigning groups, gosh, I've actually never thought about that because I, for me, it was always like a mixed bag of like, well, I just, I hope these people are going to be like, you know, people that I want to work with and are like, who are willing to spend some time on this to make it like turn out well. But I almost feel like, you know, some kind of randomization factor is good in situations where I don't know people. But beyond that, I really kind of like just choosing on my own. I don't really, I don't really enjoy having um, groups assigned in the scenarios where I can think of a group I would have liked to have been in and would have motivated me to be in, be in, but that doesn't exist all the time. So I don't know. That's like, that's a really hard question for me, me to answer because it depends on the situation, honestly. In the situation where I don't know, I think I definitely prefer just, you know, hand names in the uh, hat and then you just pull names out. Well, obviously I, I've taught for 40 years. I still don't have the answer to that question. And so that's why it's kind of unfair for me to ask you, but I think you gave the answer that most students would. Yeah, that's that's my experience too. I, I've not figured out, figured out the riddle of the, the group assignment um, and the signing of the groups, but I have heard a lot of um, good anecdotes on how to handle those group dynamics from an instructor point of view. And I wonder if our fellows have uh, had any thoughts on that, you know, examples of doing some peer evaluation that was mentioned, I think, in one of the three minute theses, uh, uh, some ideas for how, how to accomplish that and, uh, uh, um, and, uh, and various things to make sure everyone's contributing and, and that sort of thing. Any thoughts on that from the fellows or, or, or Drake as well um, from the students? Yeah, so I'll just tell you what I do. I've adopted in my electives, because my elective, electives typically have 50 students. I'll do two person teams. I'll let them pick the teams. You know, being a nice guy, I guess. Um, but. Then I give them the option if they don't want to pick a team, if they don't know anybody in class, then after a certain time limit, I assign randomized teams. Mm -hmm. Then I, um, as Roger said, I've had to mediate problems where somebody says, my partner's not going to her weight. And at that point, I, I step in and say, okay, if, uh, if there's enough evidence, I guess, with somebody complaining, I say, okay, you're working on your own, you're working on your own, that's the end of it, that's how we're going to proceed. For the rest of the semester and then at the end of the semester i'll ask each each um person in the class to send me an email evaluating them their contribution their partner's contribution and what they think the team should get as a grade that's not perfect but that's my way to kind of weigh everything and determine if somebody didn't do any work and usually it's pretty clear usually, the, the partner will say, my, my partner never showed up, he or she gets a D or an F. And then the other person will say, oh, I, I was busy this semester, I should get a C. So then I kind of know what's going on. That person didn't contribute. So that's what I do. Paul, I think you're, you're a better man than I am when you have 50 students in the class and you assign groups of two. That means you have to read 25 of these things or whatever. 
Yeah, but I find if they do three or four, then you do get people that don't do the work. And I figure with two, with two you're going to get people to do the work. That's that's my reason. In my in my role as interim associate dean, I think people are kind of thinking that I I am mean to the students. But in that regard, I'm I'm nice because if you have three, and you have the. Uh, person who is not as good as the other two being dragged along, it helps them out a little bit. I have, I have some light kind of thoughts there. Um, so recently I interviewed for Honeywell, right? And one of like the interview questions was actually, um, you know, what do you do in a group setting whenever um, someone's not like contributing their fair share to the team, right? And I won't go into my answer for that. But like, it just kind of highlights to me, like how important it is to also be prepared to work in situations where someone might not be like, um, you know, dragging their, dragging their feet or like not contributing fully to the project. And I think um, sometimes that random group assignment scenario, like every once in a while, it's a good thing to have because it forces you to work with people you wouldn't have worked with otherwise or might not be as comfortable working with. And that's kind of one of those um, soft social skills that we don't always have fully developed when we get like out in the, like the real world. But it's just good to know. I think it's especially beneficial today with um, how many different ways there are to track work on assignments, like um, everything from Google Docs editing to like a Microsoft Word like document revision history. So you can kind of see like who was, um, you know, who was carrying their weight here and who was actually not carrying their weight. But I think we just have a little more objectivity now to see if people actually like carried their weight. So I don't know. The random, I was just saying the random group scenario is still important to me too, because I think it just gets you kind of into the mindset of working with people you really don't know all that well and you wouldn't have worked with otherwise. And that's, um, that's important. And I don't think a lot of, I don't know if a lot of people really realize how important that skill is because in the real world, you will, you will not always work with people you want to work with. I think there's like a whole guide on like working with difficult people or something. I don't remember what it's called. Yeah, I want, I want to point out that I, I don't just all of a sudden if a teammate complains, I don't just break up the group. Um, I do that kind of as a last resort. Usually my first response is just that. You're gonna work work at Black and Beach and you're not gonna work like everybody you work with. So get used to it, figure it out, work it out. But there are, are these cases where students will say, this person simply doesn't reply to an email or a text. So then you gotta move on. I came across an interesting idea to evaluate group dynamics. The students are reluctant to say this person didn't do well or that person didn't do well, but if you had like a theoretical bonus and they had to justify who to give that to in the group, then you start hearing, you know, who's really working hard and who's not, and you can uh, review that. And also added to that direct point. So yeah, so that's when I do group assignment, that's what I emphasize. So that's the types of question you're going to get when you interview in the job, such as in your group project, how you're going to do that when the, one of your members is not working, how we collaborate. So that's, uh, that's one of the most common questions you're going to get in your interview. So this is the chance that you're going to prepare that. That's when I do group assignment. That's when I, that's what I emphasize. This is the types of <laughs> question you're going to get, yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting comment, actually, uh, um, telling students what they're going to be asked <laughs> in an interview as a motivation uh, for doing well. And that that comment about the group assignments is important. And uh, every once in a while, I tell the students that uh, I had uh, uh, a boss at John Deere <laughs> that always asked a question about Moore's circle. That's just designed to scare the students, though, I think. <laughs> The question is usually give us an example of a tough situation that you have encountered and how you deal with it. So, yeah, yeah, yeah especially in the group work um, context. Well, you know, I, I got up at five o'clock this morning. I thought I have to give a five minute spiel or something. And so I wrote up this whole page of stuff, okay? With, this is like a, uh, uh, what is it, Dave Letterman's, uh, uh, what's it, 10, 10, uh, top 10 list, let's hear it. <laughs> uh, no, 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 I'm not going to read it, okay, but 
uh, I'm just going to give you guys the, the headlines. I'm, you know, otherwise, it's just too long. So a lot of the stuff we have talked about already. Okay, The overall writing premise is that I look at education as a business. And if anybody thinks it's not a business, somebody ought to be in some other business. But it's a, it's a business because the student is both the customer and the product. Okay. So here are the, here's the top 10. I'm not going to start from 10. I'm just going to go one at a time. And just a headline. Number one, keep it rigorous. It referring to the class, of course. Number two, keep it doable. Number three, customers must know what to expect. Number four, show students the thought process. Right, we talk about that one. Number five, do not go over time on lectures. <laughs> Number six, do not take yourself too seriously. <laughs> Number seven, give respect to earn respect. Number eight, give students the time of day. And I think Chloe talked about that as well. Number nine, have a healthy curiosity. Try to know something about everything so that you can carry on a conversation with anybody that comes into your office. And finally, number 10, be open. Let them know what you are all about. So if anybody wants to uh, elaborate on any one of those, I'll be happy to, but you know, those are my top 10 list. All right, I think uh, the, uh, all of those mean something to, to everyone. I think those, those, that's a nice list. <laughs> yeah. And the pure embodiment in that little square on our, on our screen, because you do all of those. We try to do, I, I mean, everybody should try right to do now, all of this. Well, you're a great teacher. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. The check is in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Drake, can you tell us if Dr. Chan's ever gone over time on a lecture? Be honest. <laughs> I, um, oh man. So Dr. Chan never went over time on lectures ever, but I have a distinct memory of a time period when I didn't know how to take exams and I wasn't a very good exam taker. I have a very distinct memory of um, sitting there for, I think, oh my gosh, I don't know if it was three hours or longer on your final, the second time through your class, <laughs> finishing that final and just thinking to myself, man, I am in deep doo-doo if I don't get a good grade on this one. <laughs> um, Dr. Chan was always very punctual about lecture, lecture times. His exams are also fun because he would always give you enough time to finish them in the sense of like, you know, if you're not done in like the two hours, he'd stay longer and he'd give you that opportunity to go ahead and finish the rest of them. But um, you never needed that much time. And I realized really fast after getting out of his class that I did not need that much time. And I sat there a lot longer than I needed to, but it took me a little longer to get with the program. So I, you know, I call that my learning period and it's a little okay if I was behind there for a while. Um, yeah, no, Dr. Chan was, Dr. Chan was awesome. Dr. Chan's class was fantastic. I learned so much from that class. Thank you, Dr. Chan. Oh, you're welcome. I do a lot of things that if the registrar hears about it, uh, they will freak out. They'll probably get my tenure removed or whatever. Uh, <laughs> so one thing is I give evening exams, uh, even evening tests, even though they are not on the MISU schedule. And that's a big no-no, right? So. I can say it now, it's okay. But you know, when I when I do it, if a student says, okay, I have to babysit in the evening, um, you know, uh, I have kids at home, then they make arrangements. So you have to, to do stuff like that just so you won't get into trouble. That people mm -hmm. will have no reason to report you and it helps everybody. And you know, you have to start out saying, hey, you know, I give evening exams. Uh, if it is inconvenient for you, talk to me and I'll make arrangements. So, you know, these are the things that, you know, it's, it's, it should be easy for everybody to figure out that, hey, that's what I need to do, but not everybody does it. Yeah, I, I agree with Paul. I think, and I've said this in my three minute thesis for 10 seconds, but uh, be flexible. I found that works. I don't, find that students are trying to game the system or scam me. They got a legitimate issue with three exams on one day or this is due. Okay, let's push it back two days. Let's move the exam. 
we'll vote on it. We'll talk about it as a class. So no reason to be totally inflexible. Mm -hmm. so I agree with that. I, I want to follow up there too, actually. Um, you said the thing about like most of your students, you know, it doesn't seem like anyone's gaming the system. I would have to say in the time that I've been here, I have yet to meet like a, like a single engineering student who like, you know, didn't, didn't just completely, you know, skip prepping for something or just like completely you know, th ignore what they needed to do. Most usually what happens is um, in those scenarios where there's like, I, oh, I can't turn this in. I can't like, you know, this deadline can't be met, that kind of thing. It's really because they're coming to you and they're asking like out of like, you know, hoping that, you know, genuine goodness of your heart, you're going to give them a little bit longer to do something because they just can't take it right now and like be expected to get a good grade. And I haven't, yeah, all the people I've talked to, it's always been entirely honest with things like that. I've never heard of any, um, anyone trying to game the system, so to speak. And I don't know if it's, if it ever feels like from the professor side, like if it ever feels like people might be trying to game the system, or maybe you get like one student every once in a while who, um, you know, it seems like they're asking for a lot more than most would, but that those that that's just like my um, ten cents on it because I don't know. It's it's hard being an undergraduate engineering student and all, but I've yet to meet anyone who really just took advantage of other people like that. And I think that's like kind of like the defining line there because it's one thing to need more time on an exam; it's another thing to manipulate another person, say you need more time, and completely like lie about it, things like that. And yeah. I just don't think most engineering students go to that kind of length. Usually it's a Hail Mary because they're like, oh, I don't think anyone will change anything for me anyway. Well, here's the difference is a week before something is due, first minute of the class, I'll say, how's everybody doing on this assignment? It's due next week on, on Wednesday. If I hear nothing, okay, it's due next Wednesday. What I don't like is when the student says the day before it's due, can we return it in later? No. So tell me that next last week. So then that's, that's the difference. And I think students respect that. And that's what goes back to Paul's comment. You make them you earn their respect and you respect their other work they've got to do and, and accommodate that. But you know, not the day before it's due. That doesn't work. And one thing I get quite frequently and uh, I've never, uh, succumbed to that and, and that is students come in and say hey you know you know let's say the student was already assigned a grade whatever it is and say i need a better grade and say why and say because if i don't get a better grade i'll get dismissed or i'll get my scholarship or I'll lose my scholarship you can never uh allow that to happen or uh, and that's my advice or else uh you know it will never stop the work gets around and then you are pushed over uh, so, so I, 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 I don't do that. Now I do say, okay, uh, do you think you need, you deserve more points in any of the assignments or let me take another look at your final or whatever the case might be. That's totally reasonable, but not, not because of, uh, losing scholarships or getting dismissed or whatever the case. Yeah, it's a fine line between, uh, sort of rigor and, uh, respect and, uh, you know, and uh, empathy and that that sort of thing, you know, just has to be properly balanced, I think. I think if, as long as the students see you trying to do that, I think that, that that's going to create a lot of goodwill as well. <clears throat> All right. Um, Paul, maybe I want your top 10 list at some point. You want my top 10 list? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> now let's All put right. that on the... the Dean's website for everybody. Oh, come on. <laughs> no, no. Not a bad idea. <laughs> yeah. Well, we could at least post it along with this video. Um, that, that might be kind of fun to do. Um, we don't we don't have to put it on the main uh, uh, splash page for the College of Engineering website. <laughs> put Paul's name on it either. So. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Okay. So uh, it looks like it's 1214. And uh, to Paul's comment, we won't uh, extend this beyond <laughs> the allotted time out of respect for everyone's time. Uh, however, uh, at 1215, um, that's the la last item on our program. And I won't bring up the PowerPoint again. 
Uh, but that's the closing, and uh, and and I do feel like this uh, uh, Kemper panel uh, discussion has been a nice close to the symposium. And I appreciate all who participated, especially our our Kemper panel uh, awardees and, and and Drake as well um, from the student uh, point of view. Uh, I think it's been a very helpful and eye opening and uh, thought provoking discussion. I appreciate uh, all who participated in this this uh, portion. Yeah, applause for for all of our. Uh, 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 um, uh, people on the panel and, uh, and the participants as well. Um, but in closing for the for the symposium, you know, I really appreciate everyone's uh, participation, everyone who uh, stayed on through it the whole way live, uh, and anyone who's uh, listening to this uh, as a recorded uh, event later. Maybe you saw all or part of it uh, already, and you're listening it at uh, two times speed, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> Slow down now, uh, because uh, I also wanted to, to give my thanks uh, to our outgoing associate dean. Uh, he's, uh, as has been mentioned, Dr. Paul Chan. He's an excellent mentor, excellent teacher. Uh, I've benefited from it myself, and I really want to uh, give appreciation for his service to the college. Uh, I think it's a big effort. He's going to continue on with us, obviously, uh, as a chancellor's professor. But I really, truly appreciate uh, all that you've uh, contributed to the college um, through your whole career, but especially as, uh, as uh, associate dean. And I should say thank you very much, and I, I know I'm leaving this job in good hands. <laughs> well, hopefully it doesn't run off the rails. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, uh, I think we'll uh, draw this to a close. And uh, thank you, everyone, for participating. And we'll get this uh, posted online as soon as we can, whenever it uh, comes back from Zoom as a recorded lecture. So look for that uh, on the, the website and uh, tell all your friends. Thank you again, everyone, for participating. Have a good day and uh, enjoy finals week. <laughs> good luck on your finals, Drake. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye, everyone. All right. Thanks, Prasad. For all, all of your efforts on getting this thing organized, by the way, I forgot to mention that. Uh, uh, thanks again to the Dean's Council on Teaching Excellence. We really had um, a, a nice uh, organization for, the, for this event. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day.